shall adopt a code of ethics, including but not limited to provisions on conflict of interest, confidential information, use of position, contracts with government agencies and financial disclosure. We're gonna to touch on all of these things and more this evening. Before we do, I'd like to give kind of an overview on ethical conduct in general, just to orient us here. So ethics is a standard or philosophy of right and wrong human behavior based on logical reasoning. So ethical conduct is the type of behavior that a logical uh, person would just agree is the right thing to do under the circumstances. But here's the thing, people have different ideas about what makes behavior right and wrong. So we have ethics based on culture. We've all heard when in Rome do as the Romans do, right? Many people think that whether something is ethical depends on the setting in which it occurs, taking into account local culture, habits, customs. Hey, this is the way we've always done things in Middletown, right? We have ethics based on consequences. I'm sure you've heard the expression, well, the end justifies the means. That is where ethical or unethical conduct is determined by looking at the results. And ethical conduct is behavior that results in more positive results than negative in both quantity and quality. And then we have ethics based on character, where ethical conduct is determined by asking, what would a virtuous person do? under the circumstances. The focus there is on one's character and one's motives. I'm a fine upstanding individual. How could I possibly violate something called the code of ethics, right? So here at the Ethics Commission, we are asking you to please focus on your action, not the result. The code of ethics tells us what actions to avoid without regard to culture, without regard, regard to consequence or even character. Ethical or unethical conduct is determined not by looking at the results, but by looking at the conduct itself and judging its inherent rightness or wrongness. So a little about the actual ethics commission. There are nine members, uh, all appointed by the governor. Now, the governor appoints four directly. And while the governor selects the other five members of the ethics commission, he or she does so from lists of nominees submitted by the leaders from both the House and the Senate. All right, I will tell you that right now there are only eight members on the ethics commission. Ross Scheidt, who was uh, the, the chair for a number of years, uh, left last year, um, maybe a year and a half ago now, after serving for 15 years. So we hope to have uh, a ninth member appointed soon. But take a look at how powerful the Ethics Commission is. Advisory, investigative, adjudicative, and even in some cases, removal powers. I don't think they've used those because quite frankly, if someone's in enough of a, a jam that um, they're about to, to be removed from office, usually they voluntarily leave. So while serving on the Ethics Commission, members are prohibited from holding or campaigning for public office, they cannot hold office in any political party or on any political committee, nor can they participate in or contribute to any political campaign. Now a little about the staff. I am on the staff of the Ethics Commission. So the Ethics Commission are kind of my judges now. Instead of going to court, I go to Ethics Commission meetings and appear before the commission. So our executive director and chief prosecutor is a man named Jason Gramet. I would be surprised if many of you didn't know Jason because prior to becoming executive director in April of 2018, Jason held my job for maybe 17, 18 years. Okay, we have a total of five attorneys on staff, uh, three investigators, all of whom are retired police officers and or detectives. So they know their way around an investigation. We have an office manager. Uh, Michelle Berg is dedicated solely to financial disclosure. If you don't know her name, you might become familiar with it. And our ancillary staff. So there are 12 of us uh, at the Ethics Commission. So who is subject to this code of ethics anyway? All elected and appointed officials and employees of state and local government and of boards, commissions, and agencies are all subject to the code of ethics. So we are gonna talk about conflicts of interest. Uh, if you can see this cartoon, it says, yes, I am employee of the month again. And yes, I'm the one who chooses the employee of the month. And no, I don't see a conflict of interest. You'd be surprised. 
Conflicts of interest and nepotism are pretty much the bread and butter of the Rhode Island Ethics Commission. There are other parts of, parts of the code and other matters that we address and we will cover, but I wanted to kick things off with conflict of interest, given the importance of that role uh, with the Ethics Commission. So a person subject to the code of ethics may not participate in any matter in which he or she has an interest financial or otherwise, which is in substantial conflict with the proper discharge of his or her duties in the public interest. So to understand that, we need to know what a substantial conflict of interest is. That occurs if it is reasonably foreseeable, which I'll define for you in just a moment, that he or she, any family member, any business associate, any business by which he or she is employed or represents, will derive a direct monetary gain or even suffer a direct monetary loss by reason of his or her official activity. One would think that it's only if somebody's gonna um, take part in an activity that's going to uh, uh, result in a financial gain for someone that that's against the code. Nope, uh, there is no bias against financial loss, taking an action that will result in financial loss. Right, someone might say, you know, I may have a conflict because, uh, you know, I own property in the division that's the subject of this of this vote. But you know, I'm going to lose money if this thing passes, so it should be no problem. No, any financial impact is going to result in a, a conflict of interest. So, what is reasonably foreseeable anyway? Here's the window: reasonably foreseeable need not be certain to occur but the probability has to be greater than conceivably. That's a whole lot of airspace for reasonably uh, foreseeable, okay? So uh, we talk about business associates in the code. So let's take a look at who your business associates are. Your business associates are persons or entities with whom you are joined to achieve a common financial objective. All right, let's look at some examples. Your business partners, those are the fairly obvious ones. But tell you what, people you've hired, your attorney is your business associate, your accountant, your realtor, your contractor. The Ethics Commission has determined that landlord-tenant relationship is one of business associates. And here's one, any businesses or organizations, even a not-for-profit, okay? If you are an officer or serve on the board of directors, this is regardless of whether or not you are paid for your service. All right, so here's what the Ethics Commission looks at when they're trying to determine whether there is an ongoing business association with you and someone else, because they don't always last forever, these business associations. So they wanna know if the parties are presently conducting ongoing business transactions. Are there any outstanding accounts between the parties? Is there an anticipated future relationship? Okay, a few moments ago, I said, your realtor is your business associate. So if you sold your house in 2012 and you used a realtor to sell your house and the realtor showed the house, hopefully you got a, a, a bidding war ensued and you got more than you wanted. Uh, the closing occurred, all the funds have been distributed. You've been living in your new house for eight, not going on nine years now. No plans to use a realtor again. Um, that person is probably not your business associate, okay? Because you're not conducting ongoing business transactions, no outstanding accounts, and no anticipated future relationship. If your house is for sale now, and you've got a realtor who's gonna show the house next week, that's your business associate, and that's conflict of interest territory, all right? The code also talks about your family members, right? So we need to know who your family members are. For purposes of the code of ethics, your family members, whether by blood, marriage, or adoption, you see the list. Spouse, parents, children, siblings, grandparents, grandchildren, aunts and uncles, nieces, and nephews, and your first cousins are family members. So someone might say to me, Lynn, I haven't spoken with my sister in three years. I would no more go out of my way to help her than I would to hurt her. If she has a matter before me in my public capacity, no worries, steady as she goes, it's like she's anybody else. As unfortunate a situation as that is, the rules are the rules and a family member is a family member regardless of the status of your relationship. 
Now, the same person might say to me, what about friends? I'm much closer to my best friend than my sister. Does the code of ethics monitor friendships? Tell you what, it does not. It does not because it cannot, if you think about it. So what would the, what would the bar be? Well, did you meet in kindergarten? Did you date in high school? Do you, you know, talk on the phone twice a week now? Do you pick each other's kids up from soccer practice? So we were on that uh, appearance of impropriety that we're gonna talk about later, or just your own sense of right and wrong and what's, what's appropriate and what isn't if, uh, if something comes up involving a friend, but the code does not monitor friendships. All righty, conflict of interest. Here's the way to think of it. A conflict of interest is a situation where a person's public duties and private life intersect. Now, I said that you didn't have to memorize anything here and you don't, but I'm gonna ask you to remember this. It is not unethical to have a conflict of interest. It does not violate the code of ethics to have a conflict of interest said the woman with 31 first cousins without marriages and second kids, okay? So it's not the conflict of interest that's your problem. The potential problem is in your failure to identify and manage your conflicts. And that's what the Ethics Commission is here to help you with, okay? So do I have a conflict of interest? Here's what you're gonna ask yourself. Is it reasonably foreseeable, more than conceivably, less than certain, is it reasonably foreseeable that a decision that I'm helping to make as part of my public duties is going to result in a financial benefit or detriment to me, my family or household member, my outside employer, or my business associate? Ask yourself, even if there's no financial impact, is a family member, household member, employer or business associate a party to? or participating in the matter being discussed? If the answer is yes, you have a conflict of interest, you must recuse from participation in that particular matter. Now you might note the inclusion of the term household member in this slide, right? Under the nepotism provisions of the code of ethics, um, it has been determined that if someone lives in your home under your roof, uh, that is conflict of interest territory regardless of whether you are uh, related to that person, okay? How to recuse? Relatively easy. We ask you to complete a statement of conflict of interest form, usually available in, at uh, your clerk's office. If not, you can get one from us. Please present the original to your presiding officer or whoever your supervisor is, and do send us a copy so that if and when someone calls the Ethics Commission to recuse, uh, so-and-so uh, did not recuse from uh, participating in this matter and clearly had a conflict of interest. We open up our book. Absolutely, the person did recuse. Okay, I know I'm moving out of clip, but I don't want you to get bored. And again, you're going to have access to this. This is to become familiar, not to uh, become an expert overnight. So nepotism. This is my nephew, Skippy. He's your new boss. Okay, the uh, Code of Ethics frowns on that. And again, nepotism is the second of the big two conflicts of interest in nepotism. So we're gonna dive right into nepotism for just a few minutes here. You may not participate in any matter as part of your public duties if there is reason to believe or expect that any person within your family or household member is a party to or a participant or will derive a direct monetary gain or will suffer a direct monetary loss or somehow obtain uh, an employment advantage of some sort. So keep in mind, these prohibitions apply regardless. Your family or household member could objectively absolutely be the most qualified candidate for a job or deserving of promotion. But if it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen without your participation. The policy underlying the prohibitions against nepotism recognizes, you know what, it's just real hard for anybody to be truly objective when considering matters impacting family and household members. And again, don't forget that constitutionally founded goal of avoiding the appearance of impropriety. Are there people who could absolutely make an unbiased decision about a family member? Sure, but we're not even gonna uh, make anybody try. 
because again, it's, it's really hard to do that and it just looks bad. All righty. So moving on, let's look at some examples of nepotism. Not, not the whole list, but these are things that would pop up that might make you stop and think. Hiring a family or household member, okay? Awarding a contract to someone in your family or household. Any decision regarding a family or household member's property. Appointment of someone in your family or household to a financially remunerated position, say a board that has a stipend or something. And participation in a disciplinary matter in which a family or household member's employment is at risk. Those are all uh, samples, okay? So <clears throat> here's a scenario. Andy, Andy is a member of the town council and the town has just released a request for proposals, RFP, for the construction of a new municipal playground, a wonderful thing. Billy is Andy's nephew. Billy's got a construction company that submits a bid in response to the RFP. So I'm going to ask you to think about the following. Does Billy have to withdraw his bid? Because his uncle's on the town council. How about this? May Andy participate as long as he discloses the relationship with Billy? And the third thing I want you to think about is whether Andy must recuse from all aspects of the bid selection process in this case. And tell you what, if you said that, you're absolutely right because Andy must recuse from all aspects of the bid selection process here. Billy's not subject to the code of ethics in this example, right? He owns, he's a guy in private industry that owns a construction company. He doesn't have to withdraw his bid. Uncle Andy's the one with the conflict here. And while it kind of has a nice sound to it, that, you know, as long as Andy tells everybody straight up, Billy's my nephew. So, you know, I just want everyone to be aware, not enough, okay? So advocacy and supervision. You may not participate in the supervision, evaluation, appointment, classification, promotion, transfer, or discipline of anybody in your family or your household. You may not delegate to a subordinate any of those same tasks. You know why, your subordinate works for you. You might as well do it yourself, okay? Now, tell you what, the Code of Ethics allows the Ethics Commission to approve what's called an alternate chain of command. This sometimes comes up in, uh, I don't know, certain legacy jobs, fire departments, police departments, jobs that draw people from the same family often. But I'll tell you what, a couple of things on an alternate chain of command. The person who is gonna stand in for the person that has the conflict has to be of equal rank or higher than the person with the conflict. And you can't just presume that an alternate chain of command is acceptable prior to the issuance of a duly authorized advisory opinion. You're gonna leave here knowing what an advisory opinion is and how to get one. All right. Um, Moving on, recusal. Recusal does not mean that a public official has to leave the room if it's an open meeting. But I'll tell you right now, that's best practice and that's what we recommend, okay? Um, at the very least, you have to leave the table. So if you are on uh, the town council and you are going to recuse, even if you sit at the town council table with your hands folded with a piece of masking tape over your mouth or your head down, it still has an appearance of participation. So you're definitely gonna leave the table. Um, do you have to leave the room if it's open session? No, you do not. But no good's gonna come of you staying in that room. Um, you know, if, if Uncle Andy in the last scenario he gets up uh, and says, next on the agenda is the municipal playground. Uh, I'm gonna recuse because my nephew, Billy, uh, his company put in a bid. And before I sit down, let me just tell you a little bit about Billy, right? Graduated top of his class, shovels snow for shut-ins in the, you know, for seniors in the winter, delivers meals on wheels, but tell you what, I'm not going to uh, take part. I'm just gonna, I'll be over here in the front row, you know, with his arms crossed, rolling his eyes if he hears something he doesn't like maybe texting and someone might suspect that he's texting someone on the town council. 
All right, so I've beaten that horse to death. So moving on, don't have to leave if it's an open session. Leave the table, you should leave the room, but if you don't, you'll probably survive a complaint. However, if the public body is an executive session, once a public official has recused, no more right to be in the room than any member of the general public. All righty. All right, C is for contracts. We're gonna gloss over this kind of quickly. Uh, no person subject to the code of ethics may enter into any contract with a state or municipal agency unless the contract has been awarded through an open and public process, including prior public notice and subsequent public disclosure of all proposals considered and contracts awarded. So tell you what, there are certain contracts for professional services that are customarily awarded without competitive bidding, those aren't subject to, the comp to competitive bidding. If they're awarded through a process of public notice and disclosure of financial details. Here's some examples. Physicians, attorneys, engineers, architects, accountants, land surveyors, and psychologists. All righty. So secondary employment. Sometimes we call this moonlighting. Uh, many of us have second jobs in addition to our um, public job, and that's okay. But I'm going to tell you the uh, position of the Ethics Commission on secondary employment. You may have a private or public sector job in addition to your state or municipal position. However, remember these two things. You may not accept outside employment that's going to impair your independence of judgment with respect to your official duties. or that's going to uh, require or induce you to disclose confidential government information, all right? So let me give you an idea of some of the things that the Ethics Commission looks at when someone asks for an advisory opinion on secondary employment. The commission's gonna look at the nexus between that person's public duties and private employment. The work absolutely has to be completed outside of the public officials' normal uh, work hours and without the use of public resources. The official or employee may not appear before his or her own agency. The work must be conducted outside of areas over which an official or employee has decision-making jurisdiction. And the official or employee may not use his or her public position, <clears throat> pardon me, to solicit business or customers. So let's give an example, a real life example. Uh, DCYF, Department of Children, Youth and Families. Let's say that a social worker who's subject to the code of ethics as a state employee, uh, loves animals, loves dogs, and decides to start a side business, walking dogs and boarding dogs for people who have to go away. So she's not gonna use her uh, DCYF email address to have people contact her. She's not gonna run off flyers on DCYF's copy machine advertising her new business. She's not gonna put those flyers in the, in the elevator leading up to her floor at DCYF at Friendship Street, right? And um, she's not gonna go on a visit to check on the well-being of a child at a foster home, right? And then notice on her way out that the, the family has a dog and say, uh, can, thank you foster parent for taking such good of, of care of this child. I see you have a dog. If you ever leave town and need uh, someone to watch the dog, I'm your gal. That's, so that's an example of, of, of no good, <laughs> okay? Um, next, this should come as no surprise. You may not use or disclose for financial gain, confidential information acquired in the course of your official duties. That makes sense. All right, back to appearance of impropriety that we mentioned. Remember, it's in the Constitution. What is it? The appearance of impropriety is a phrase referring to a situation which to a lay person without knowledge of the specific circumstances might seem to raise some ethics questions. All right. So as you know, when enacting the Code of Ethics, the General Assembly included as one of its legislative purposes, the elimination of impropriety. What they didn't do was make the appearance of impropriety a violation of the law because you just can't. It's an appearance, right? It's not, um, it's very subjective. So 
very wise man uh, and friend of mine, Steve Cross, who's the chief investigator at the Ethics Commission, what he tells folks when he does, uh, when he talks to them on this is he will say, if you're trying to figure out whether something that you want to do has an appearance of impropriety, imagine you taking the action and the next day it's on the front page of the Providence Journal or the lead story on a local news channel, okay? Um, it's a bell you can't unring. So let's say you take an action that has an appearance of impropriety. Again, an appearance of impropriety is not a violation of the code of ethics. Doesn't mean that uh, your neighbor is not gonna call us and file a complaint against you. And the complaint may not get accepted, but if there's enough bones on the complaint to get accepted, and then let's say eventually it gets thrown out when everything's sorted out, right? The uh, the so-and-so accused of violating the code of ethics is going uh, right above the fold on the journal in 44 font. And if and when that thing gets thrown out, you'll be lucky to see it weeks later in the, in the uh, legal notices, okay? So somewhere between doing absolutely nothing and getting a full-blown advisory opinion, which we're gonna talk, which we're gonna talk about, is pick up the phone, give us a call. We we field calls from people every day of the week who say, I want to talk something over with you. I'm not sure that I need an advisory opinion or want an advisory opinion, but here's the situation. And it's been my experience, because I man the phones as well. Um, that sometimes people just need to talk it out. I've had people, I haven't had to say a word and they've said, you know what, I'm not voting. I'm just not. Even if it's technically okay, in this case, it's, it's too close to call. So I'm not gonna do it. So give us a call um, and, and I will give you the contact information. Um, but heck, if you're, if you're looking for it now, our number is 222-3790. And uh, you can always feel free to call me directly. My extension is 24. Um, moving on, gifts, very popular topic, uh, especially in recent months. So here's the scoop on the gift provisions of the uh, code of ethics. If you participate in making decisions, you may not accept cash or forgiveness of debt from interested persons, I'll identify, I'll, uh, I'll tell you what an interested person is for you in a moment. You may accept things of value up to and including $25 per instance and $75 per year from each interested person. Um, so first things first, an interested person is a person, business or representative that has a direct financial interest in a decision that you either make or participate in making, okay? Um, I'm told once upon a time years back, the $25 was $150 and 450 a year per interested person. Um, ordinarily things like this go up as the years pass, but I don't know if it was out of hand or what, but it's down to 25. And I'll tell you what, if your municipal agency has a zero tolerance policy on gifts, which is not a bad idea, or even just one that is more stringent than the code of ethics, that's the one you have to follow, okay? Um, let's see, transactions with subordinates. You may not engage in a financial transaction, including private employment or consulting, giving or receiving loans, monetary, political, or charitable contributions with an employee, contractor, or consultant over whom you exercise supervisory responsibilities, okay? There are some exceptions. They include financial transactions in the normal course of a regular commercial business. Um, if the subordinate initiates the financial transaction, or for certain charitable events, if they're sponsored by the highest official or governing body of the state or municipality. Alrighty, now, 
No person shall solicit or request directly or through a surrogate political contributions from a subordinate for whom in that official or employee's official duties and responsibilities, he or she exercise, exercises supervision over that person. All right, now, this does not prohibit or limit the First Amendment right of a subordinate to make political contributions. So in English, what this means is, you can't, uh, you can't shake down your, the, the people that you supervise to, camp, to con contribute to your political campaign. And you can't ask others to do it for you. If someone who works for you comes to you and says, I would like to contribute, they've got a First Amendment right to do so. Okay. The revolving door, there are several revolving door provisions in the Code of Ethics. So let's look at, let's look at uh, this one. No elected or appointed official may accept any appointment or election that requires approval by the board over which he or she is or was a member to any position that carries with it financial benefit or remuneration. And this prohibition continues for one year after termination of his or her membership on such a body. There are exceptions. There's an exception if the exception is approved by the ethics commission, but here's what they're gonna look for. They wanna be satisfied that denial of such employment or the position will be a hardship, not for the person who wants the job, but the hardship has to be for the body, board or municipality, okay? Um, all right, that's that on that revolving door. So no member of the General Assembly shall seek or accept state employment not held at the time of the member's election while serving in the General Assembly and for a period of one year after leaving legislative office. Municipal official revolving door. No municipal elected official or school committee member, whether elected or appointed, while holding office and for a period of one year after leaving municipal office shall seek or accept employment with any municipal agency in the municipality in which the official serves, other than employment held at the time the person was elected or appointed to their public position, okay? Um, representing self or others before a state or municipal agency. So generally speaking, you may not represent yourself or anyone else before the agency that you are a member of or employed by or any other agency for which you are the appointing authority, all right? You may not serve as an expert witness before your own agency. These prohibi prohibitions continue for one year after you leave your public office or employment, okay? So representing oneself uh, or others means that the person is participating in the presentation of evidence or arguments before that agency to try and influence the judgment of that agency in his or her own favor or that of the person that they're representing. All right, again, there's exceptions to every rule just about. Here's the exception to representing yourself before your own agency. The Ethics Commission may grant what's called a hardship exception allowing you to represent yourself before your own agency. To obtain an exception, you must request an advisory opinion. All right, I'll give you a quick example. A member of the zoning board needs a variance to build a shed on his personal residential property. He's on the planning board. He's not supposed to appear before himself. Guy wants to build a shed, okay? There are times that the ethics commission has granted a hardship exception. Now that having been said, the guy's not gonna vote on the matter, that's for sure. He's gonna recuse. But may that situation may constitute a hardship to the extent that the commission will allow it. Complaints, we sure get them. Um, for the past few years, there's been a moratorium on the acceptance of complaints by the Ethics Commission for the 90 day period preceding an election. You can imagine how once upon a time that kind of got out of hand if you wanted to put, if someone uh, 
wanted to put an opponent's name out there in an unfavorable light, just file a, an ethics complaint, right? So there was a moratorium of 90 days, which gets lifted after the election. So about complaints, um, anybody may submit a complaint to the Ethics Commission on a form provided by us. It's gotta be signed under oath, an original signature. It's gotta name the individual alleged to have violated the code. We call that the respondent. The person needs to identify the respondent's public office and detail the specific acts which allegedly violated the code. Now an ethics complaint is not public unless and until it's accepted by the executive director. And another thing to keep in mind is the complainant is not a party. It's not person who files complaint versus respondent. It's in re the respondent, okay? Sometimes a complainant can think that he or she is, you know, part of the action and is gonna be brought in on everything that goes on. That's not the case. Um, another thing to keep in mind, we talk about complaints and prosecuting complaints before the Ethics Commission and violations of statutes. Ethics complaints are civil in nature. They're not criminal in nature, okay? Um, that's not to say that there haven't been situations where the Ethics Commission is prosecuting a civil complaint against someone and the Department of Attorney General has a concurrent complaint against the same person for a criminal act, all right? But Ethics Commission is civil in nature. Prior to filing a complaint, we invite complainants to telephone the Ethics Commission, speak with uh, Steve or Gary or Peter, uh, all on the investigative staff, run it by them, have a little chat about the, the, the parts of the code, uh, they're not going to talk you into or out of filing your complaint, <clears throat> but it's a good idea to have uh, a little bit of a conversation to, to flesh out what you're thinking a little bit and to make sure you have the appropriate paperwork. We're not going to go through the whole complaint process, but here's something that you'll find interesting, I hope. Initial determination. The Ethics Commission will determine, this is the very first step after a complaint's been accepted. The Ethics Commission will determine whether the complaint properly alleges facts that if true, are sufficient to constitute a violation of the law. Meeting in closed executive session, the Ethics Commission decides to either dismiss the complaint or to authorize a full investigation. And they don't look beyond the four corners of the complaint at this stage. And you know what? It's a very low bar to get past initial determination, to look at it and say, you know what, if this is true, it's a violation. So we're gonna, you know, if they decide that, then that just authorizes a full investigation, which may result in a determination that, no, this isn't a violation of the code. Now, anytime following the initial determination, the Ethics Commission and the respondent can agree to some sort of informal disposition through a settlement or a consent order or some other resolution. Uh, that's it on complaints. Let's talk advisory opinions. We're rolling right along, making good time. Um, almost done here. Advisory opinions. What are they? It's a legal interpretation of the code of ethics issued by the ethics commission. It provides specific guidance about a particular and impending circumstance. And it's based on the representations of the person who's seeking it. We call that the petitioner. A couple things. We would love to be able to, well, not that we'd love to, but if we get a letter that says, you know, I'm subject to the code of ethics, and you know what I've always wondered? Can somebody do this? We can't give an advisory opinion on that. It has to be a specific and pending circumstance. You know why? Because the facts of a situation drive the advisory opinions. And when I say it's based on the representations of the petitioner, that's because um, someone sends us a letter, right? Seeking an advisory opinion. Um, I'm not gonna get an investigator to go investigate the facts and make sure they're accurate. We rely on the representations of the petitioner. It's not an adversarial process, an advisory opinion, okay? So who may request one? A person subject to the code about a particular provision which may affect him or her, okay? You're not gonna say, I'm on the town council in Middletown and I'm concerned because someone on the uh, school committee is about to take part in, in, in a vote. And I think 
he or she might have a conflict. So can I get an advisory opinion on that? No, you may not. Only happy to write one if the person that's going to be, that's going to be uh, subject to it um, or who it's going to be binding asks for it. Okay. And the time to get an advisory opinion, my friends, is before taking official action. Here's why. The Ethics Commission does not opine on past conduct. So if you say, you know, last April I voted on something and I'm quite sure that it was no conflict of interest. Can I get an advisory opinion saying that it was a-okay? No, you may not. They don't advise on prior conduct. <clears throat> You'll know it's a-okay if uh, someone comes out of the blue and files a complaint and it gets dismissed. All right, so the time to ask is before taking official action. How do you get one of these advisory opinions? To request an advisory opinion, you must either mail or hand deliver to the commission a letter containing your original signature and the following info. We need your name. Please, please, please include your telephone number and email address. Briefly, just the name, jurisdiction, and powers of your agency commissioner office. Your official position, little description of your duties. Identify the nature of the potential conflict. Give us a summary of relevant facts. And do let us know if you have time constraints. Here's why. The Ethics Commission generally meets twice each month, always on a Tuesday, always at 9 a.m., okay? Um, in the summer, they meet once a month. And the draft advisory opinions are due a week before the commission meeting. So, you know, we may have in double digits going at any given time, and we get through them as quickly as we can. But if somebody needs an AO right away, we're going to try and accommodate. Can't always do it. There are some times when people will have to either recuse and get an AO for the next time the matter comes up or uh, continue something on an agenda because someone's waiting to get an advisory opinion. I've seen that happen as well. So um, when I'm not doing these trainings, um, my colleague and friend, Theodore Papa and I write 95% of the advisory opinions, okay? Um, what was it? Oh, here's, this is very important. The Ethics Commission is encouraging the use of email to request an advisory opinion during the pandemic, okay? Um, and again, you don't have, it looks like you have to include a lot of info. Don't worry about writing a three-page essay because Teddy or I, whoever picks up or gets the sign to your advisory opinion is gonna give you a call and say, I just wanna make sure I understand the facts and I might ask you some more questions. If you are questioned after submitting your request, please, please, please know that we are not asking questions to be judgmental or nosy or anything. When we write an advisory opinion, we have to apply the facts against the code and against prior advisory opinions. So we know what we're looking for, okay, when we ask certain questions. Um, what happens after you submit your request? You're going to get an acknowledgement from the Ethics Commission saying, we got your request. Um, you're going to get a draft that's been prepared by one of us. You are strongly encouraged to attend the commission meeting at which your advisory opinion will be considered. And it's very easy to do so these days because since April, we've been doing them via Zoom. And I think it's worked out a lot better for folks who don't necessarily, you know, it might be difficult to, to get into the city of Providence and find a place to park and get upstairs for quarter of nine to sign in. Uh, this Zoom thing has worked out quite well. Um, also, the reason you want to attend is because the commissioners might have a question. And if I can't answer it or Teddy can't answer it, or they just want to hear from you, then, you know, they may have to kick it over for another day till you can be there. Um, and you might have a question of the commission as well. So take an advantage of the opportunity to be there. Um, you will need an affirmative vote of five commissioners to get an advisory opinion approved. That's regardless of how many you're sitting. You're gonna get a written copy and it's gonna be available on the Ethics Commission website. And both your advisory opinion and your request for it are public records, okay? So I mentioned that these advisory opinions are available on the Ethics Commission website. So you may want to go on the website one day if you have a question and 
uh, plug in a couple of terms and out pops an advisory opinion from 2019. And you read it and you say, son of a gun, that's my very question. Same thing, all you gotta change in this is the names. Um, I'm gonna just rely on this one and not even bother to get an advisory opinion. Please don't do that, okay? Do read that advisory opinion, get an idea which way the wind might be blowing when yours goes before the ethics commission. But again, these things turn on very specific facts. There might be something you don't even realize that's gonna change the outcome for better or for worse for you. So you might see that advisory opinion cited in your draft, but you, you can the only person who can rely on an advisory opinion is the person for whom it was written. All righty, financial disclosure, rounding the uh, home stretch here. Who's <clears throat> required, pardon me, to file a yearly financial statement? All state elected officials, all state appointed officials, all state employees who hold a major decision-making position in a state agency, all municipal elected officials, and certain municipal appointed officials. I tell you what, if you've got to file a financial statement, you're going to know it because Michelle Berg is going to be practically a pen pal. She sends out so many reminders to people. And if you don't, if the suspense is killing you and you're not sure, give us a call. Say, you know, this is, uh, I'm so-and-so, and this is what I do for the town of Middletown. Not sure I need to file a financial statement. Can you tell me? And, and we can tell you, okay? So what's the purpose of these financial disclosure statements anyway? Tell you what, helps ensure that people who are acting in the public interest do not use their public positions to further their private financial interests. Helps identify any conflicts between an official's financial interests and his or her public office. It increases the overall transparency in government appointments and decision-making, and it does help further the public's confidence in government. All right. Um, when do these have to be filed? Last Friday in April. Again, you'll receive reminder after reminder after reminder. Or within 30 days of your appointment to a public position, or within 30 days of your having filed a notice of organization with the Board of Elections, or declared as a candidate, whichever comes first. Please know that all officials required to file must continue to file financial disclosure statements until they have been out of office for one full calendar year. Okay, we encourage you to file online at the Ethics Commission website, which is listed right here. Um, we have over a 99% compliance rate, which is wonderful. And most people do file online. If you would prefer to fill out uh, the, the paper, the hard copy, we'll send you one if you, if you call and ask for one. But to put it on the website, I mean, to put it online, that's going to hold your information over to the next year and all you have to do is edit it. Whereas if you fill it out by hand, you've got to repeat the whole process. And I'll tell you what, we want you to file these things. No one is standing by waiting to file a complaint at the stroke of midnight after they're due. Okay. Um, if anything, you'll get a call from someone a month, you know, after the deadline and say, did you know you had to file or did you forget to file or can we be helpful in helping you file? All right. Feel free to call with your questions. I've seen staff assist people um, filling out their financial statements over the phone. They stay on the phone with them. Next question. All righty. Um, Rhode Island Ethics Commission. We hang out at 40 Fountain Street on the eighth floor in Providence. And again, our number is 222-3790. Uh, I'm at extension 24 if you need me. Um, during the pandemic, walk-in hours are limited. So we ask that people give a call first. Um, I know this has been a lot. We have reached the end. You have been delightfully attentive for which I'm grateful. Your heads must be spinning. Um, but you know, this is the big picture. So at this point, I'm going to stop sharing the screen and I just want to check in to see if, um, Anybody's got any questions? I don't know um, if, um, I don't know, uh, Mr. President, if you want to 
handle acknowledging people or if uh, we want to, I don't know, that mm -hmm. people need to raise their hands. It's usually worked out well. And unless things get kind of crazy, we'll, we'll just go with it. <laughs> Len, I can't thank you enough. Oh, my pleasure. For being with us here the, this evening with us. Uh, do any counselors have any questions of Lynn they'd like to ask? Okay. See you. Uh, uh, Councilor Flynn. You're muted, Councilor Flynn. I got my video walking working. Can everyone hear me? Thank you. So this is a question that comes up quite a bit, Lynn, and thank you so much for the uh, new and improved presentation. It was great. Um, and when you, if you recuse from an issue, uh, can you speak from the lectern as someone who has information or perspective or have constituents who, you know, are also involved and would like to be heard? Um, there are a couple of ways to do that, Counselor. Um, there is something called the public forum exception. And rather than risk messing that one up, I just want to um, tell you what that says. It's very short. All right. Public forum exception. No violation of this chapter or regulations shall result by virtue of any person publicly expressing his or her own viewpoints in a public forum on any matter of general public interest or on any matter which directly affects said individual or his or her spouse or dependent child. Now, that's not to be confused with a hardship exception to appear before your own agency. And sometimes, uh, sometimes this code is clear as mud to even me after two years with the Ethics Commission and, you know, 22 years as, as an attorney. Um, because when someone appears before the Ethics Commission Or, or if someone's family member appears before them during like a public public forum situation, it's gotta be where everyone there has the same opportunity to speak. It can't be, uh, step aside, make way, uh, Councilor Flynn has something to say. She's not voting on this, but, and we only have time for two people to speak. And, you know, everybody gets two minutes to speak except you know, Councillor Flynn gets 15 minutes. You know what I'm saying? It has to be, um, to be honest, I'm a belt and suspenders kind of gal. If you're looking to do this, please call us. I know that's, I wish there was like a, you know, if this was math, there's a right answer, there's a wrong, num a wrong answer. Two plus two is four, but it's really not. It's, it can be so gray. Thank so, you very much. I appreciate okay. that. Council of Toronto. Hi there. Thank you, Mr. President. And yes, thank you very much, uh, Lynn, for uh, sharing this with us. It's uh, very interesting. I'm serving my third term and um, I always learn every time we have this type of meeting, different things. And I would agree, you know, based on decisions you've made a couple of years ago, doesn't mean that that's the decision that you would make today because things change and they evolve. I was always kind of under the understanding was that, and, and this is, sort of my question is, if, if something affected a finite unit of people, in other words, this wasn't a decision that affected the whole town, it's just affecting a small segment of the market, that's when you got to have some consideration, but or an opinion. But if it's a decision that affects the whole town as a whole, where does that come into play? Do you mean if, if the person who wants to vote has a conflict of interest, but the, the issue affects the whole town? Yes. You're kind of, um, have you heard of the class exception? I don't know if everyone, if anyone's familiar with that term, but there is something called the class exception. It's not, it's not, you know, cookie cutter, easy to understand, but generally speaking, not only does the matter have to affect a a large group or, or a certain group of people, it has to affect them all in the same way. So for example, class exception is rarely applied to matters involving real property. 
because real property is so, you know, can be fluctuating and affect different people with different values of property differently. However, and I'm using this just as an example, not as a permission to go out and do something. Um, believe me, if, if, if you're ever saying, I did something because Lynn Radisha said it was okay, all that's <laughs> gonna happen is I'm gonna get fired and you're probably gonna get in trouble. <laughs> so this is for purposes of conversation. So if the vote is to, um, I don't know, increase a particular tax and it's across the board, every resident of town is going to, I don't know, taxes are gonna increase by $90, regardless of who you are or what your situation is. You know, that is more of a closer to the class exception. So when in doubt, seek an AO on that. Okay, yeah, because there's certain things that, decisions that can be made and someone may not be participating in that type of situation, but if they wanted to participate in that particular situation, they would be affected by the ruling that's being made. In other words- Right, they may be part of the class. And, they, and it could be, today I don't do A, but there's a segment of people that do A, but someday I might want to do A. And if they change a rule, that could affect what I might be able to do in the future. Well, that's another thing, because then we're back to reasonable foreseeability. Uh, again, we go with the facts as they are. Okay. Now, I know that in that example of um, business associates, we talked about, is there an anticipated future relationship? You know what that's trying to eliminate is if somebody has a business associate and uh, let's say uh, it's their accountant and the accountant has somebody before, you know, has a matter before them and they're like, it's a business associate, it's an accountant. Tell you what, uh, you're fired as my accountant. I'll see you in six months when this thing blows over. That's an anticipated future relationship, you know? But if someone is saying, well, someday I might possibly want to take advantage of this thing that's being voted on, that's, it's, it's kind of gray. Right. You know, okay, but when you. in doubt, either sit it out or uh, the other expression, uh, I want to have a t-shirt made <laughs> better an AO today than a complaint tomorrow. <laughs> um, Thank you. Thank but, the, you. but this stuff can be tricky. I, I came to the ethics commission two years ago and had to do my first training probably three or four weeks in. I had no idea what I was talking about. Um, that, that theater major in college I had came in handy because you know, I <laughs> pretended I knew, but, um, I came by way of, I was, a, a CASA attorney for family court before, immediately before this job. So I represented children ages, newborn to 21, whose parents were charged with abuse and neglect by DCYF. Before that, I was a divorce lawyer and a mediator. I started my career as a criminal prosecutor for the AG's office. I went and did business litigation for a number of years. So, um, you know, I can read and, and, and write and stuff, but this was brand new. I didn't know there was an ethics commission. Yep. It's brand new for me too. So yeah. I yeah. appreciate being more conservative and I will seek out an opinion if, if you know, Absolutely. after what I've seen. So, and thank you for all you do. It sounds like you, you know, I appreciate your help. I, I'm, I'm so in awe of all of you that uh, your commitment to public service, I applaud it. Um, I really do. And how many nights a week you must be out or, you know, you could be sitting and watching Jeopardy or, or whatever. And uh, instead you're out serving on top of what you do during the day. So I give you a lot of credit. Well, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, any other uh, councilman? Okay. Madam Clerk, do we have any people that want to speak or ask a question? Nobody, uh, nobody has, Karen says nobody has their hand raised, Bob. Okay, I see awesome. it. Now. Lynn, again, thank you, thank you, thank you. My pleasure, don't be strangers. We'll see you in two years. Okay, take it. Somebody will. <laughs> All righty. All right, thank Thanks, you. Lynn. Bye. My Thanks. pleasure, good night. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Lynn. Okay. Item number three, Memorandum of the Town Administrator, Mayford River Restoration Project Update. Motion to begin said memorandum and begin said presentation. Do I have a second? 
I'll second it. We have a motion and seconded to begin. All in favor? Aye. 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 Mr. Brown? Uh, Mr. President, uh, this evening we have an update from Elizabeth Scott from the uh, Southeastern New England uh, program on the town's uh, Mayford River restoration project. Uh, you've received a briefing about this in the past and it is an update. Uh, there's two parts to the program. One is floodplain restoration, which is what Elizabeth's focus will be on tonight. Uh, there's a second phase to the project, which is the restoration of riparian buffers along the Mayford River. Uh, just as a reminder, this is a project with a focus on water quality mitigating flooding, uh, maintaining uh, natural habitat, and really resiliency or building resiliency back into the Mayford River. Um, and what we're looking to do tonight is to be transparent about the progress that we're making. Also to uh, make sure the council uh, is uh, basically continuing to endorse this project as something that we're working on. And just as a reminder, uh, the work that we're doing today and we'll continue to work on uh, over the next uh, upcoming months, the uh, product uh, coming out, I believe our goal is next, sep next September is to finish design and engineering, permitting, bid documents, and uh, some advice regarding how we can finance this project. Uh, that work is coming at no cost to the town. Uh, that's being... Uh, funded through various uh, sources uh, with the, 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 the SNEP program basically uh, assisting us uh, and, and at the point that we get to those four deliverables, uh, the council would make a decision on, on how we would proceed with the project. So with that, uh, Elizabeth is online. I'll let her uh, provide a presentation. Uh, just for your information, we have been meeting with property owners uh, we met with property owners uh, about two weeks ago, a week ago. Uh, Jan Eckard, who's affected by this, uh, the Wyndham Hill Homeowners Association, uh, the Whitehall neighborhood, and uh, people that are down in the uh, Whitehall uh, neighborhood itself, uh, down in that, that small uh, neighborhood on the west side of, of uh, Berkeley Avenue. So with that, uh, if the clerk can start the presentation and Elizabeth will walk us through it, um, it'll bring you up to speed on the work that we've been doing. Good evening, Elizabeth, and welcome. Hi, thank you. Nice to see you all. Happy New Year. Um, I, um, as soon as this comes up, um, the first couple of slides will be just a refresher. So. Um, I don't expect you would remember the presentation from, I think it was August 17th. So I'll give you just a little bit of background information on the project and then um, get right into the updates. So if you could put that into the presentation mode, that would be great. The slideshow mode just makes it a little bit bigger. Great, uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so um, as Sean explained, uh, the town is working with the Quidnick Land Trust with support from the Southeast New England Program Network, affectionately known as the SNP Network or just the network. I will probably refer to it as that going forward. Um, to advance use of nature-based solutions to reduce flooding and improve water quality on Maidford River. Um, so as Sean explained, there's really two components. Um, and tonight I'm really just going to be talking about the floodplain restoration um, component um, of, the, of the project. Um, the project team, in addition to the town of Middletown and the Quidnick Land Trust, includes um, the SNEP network partners, um, Save the Bay, myself, uh, Throw Environmental and the um, New England Environmental Finance Center. 
Um, and then the Eastern Rhode Island Conservation District is another member of the project team. And we have hired Fuss and O'Neill um, to be the consultant on this project. They were involved with the town's um, earlier Mayford River um, uh, management plan development and also uh, development of a conservation plan for um, a Quidnick Land Trust. So they're very familiar with this watershed. Um, and they have hired um, Interfluve, which is as a subcontractor to assist on the project. And that's a firm that does just solely works on river restoration, water restoration projects. So we absolutely have um, the right team together for this project. Next, please. Um, so the Southeast New England program network is a collaborative network of 15 partners. We have expertise in stormwater management, financing, and watershed scale conservation and restoration. And our mission really is to empower communities to achieve healthy watersheds and sustainable financing, and ultimately long-term climate resilience um, through improved management of stormwater and restoration, such as this project that we're doing on the Maidford. Um, and basically our approach is that we deliver technical assistance and training to municipalities, organizations, and tribes um, to create improved norms of practice and financing and peer-to-peer -peer exchange across the region. Um, the SNAP network is administered by the New England Environmental Finance Center, which is at the University of Southern Maine in Portland. And um, they have funding from the US Environmental Protection Agency for this project. So they've, they've signed a five-year cooperative agreement um, with EPA, and we are in year two of, um, of that uh, cooperative agreement. Um, the Mayford River Restoration Project is one of two pilot projects um, for the SNAP network. And really, um, it's unique from other assistance projects that we're doing with other communities um, in that um, it's really, they're, they're geared, these pilot projects are geared to overcome common obstacles and advance watershed scale nature-based solutions um, to mitigate flooding, improve water quality and build climate resilience. So in addition to this work on the Maidford River, there's another one um, on the Canoe River Aquifer in, um, I think it's Easton, Mass, um, so Southeastern Massachusetts. Um, we're working with, um, we've got uh, 12 other um, communities that we're working with across the Southeast New England region. Next, please. So on the Maidford River, um, Flooding is the most obvious of problems that we're working to mitigate. Um, those of you who are familiar with this part of town know that it doesn't take a whole lot of rain for the Maidford River to flow outside of its channel and um, it floods um, local roads and lawns and farm fields. And obviously it creates lots of problems in doing so. It creates public safety hazards. Um, many of you know that this Berkeley Avenue has to be closed from time to time throughout the year because of flooding. Um, it obviously causes damage to private property and contributes to water quality problems. Um, the river is very flashy in wet weather, meaning it can go from very low flow to really a torrent of water flowing downstream. Um, and it happens very quickly. Um, the area of our project, which basically for this part of the work we're doing is just north of the Berkeley Avenue um, overpass um, to Green End Avenue. And it's depicted in that, um, that excerpt from the town's um, hazard mitigation plan. And it's, it's basically, you know, one of the areas of town that's been identified as a flood hazard zone. Next, please. And I just wanted to note too, that the, obviously in wet weather, you can see the color of the water, very turbid, very sediment filled. Um, in addition to the sediment, there's also lots of pollutants that get, get discharged um, downstream with attached to those sediment particles. Um, so the Mayford River has is, is been identified by DEM as impaired by bacteria, nutrients, and suspended solids. And it's, um, it's like a small river, an almost non-existent river at some times of the year, but it really has an outsized impact on sensitive natural resources. And in particular, you know, the greatest concern of all of that is um, its contribution to degraded water quality in Nelson Pond and Gardner Reservoir, two of Newport's drinking water supply reservoirs. It also contributes to degraded habitat in the, the Satuous Marsh, 
um, which is home to the salt marsh sparrow, a species of high conservation concern. And then lastly, um, its waters can also um, threaten recreational shell fishing uses, and that's the high bacteria levels that it can contain, um, including um, Third Beach. And the, this photo shows the um, algal growth, which is indicative of a nutrient, excessive nutrients in the river. So um, there's been a lot of work on this teeny little river um, to date. And one of the um, studies was done by the University of Rhode Island's Department of Natural Resources, which um, confirmed the significance of storms and high flow events to, um, they studied dissolved nutri nutrients, but it's really all, um, all pollutants are pretty much affected by, um, are worsened in wet weather conditions. Um, and I won't belabor the point, but it, it basically, they documented um, a significant amount of the pollution um, that's discharged from this river into the Newport water supply system. It does occur during wet weather conditions and just one storm alone, and granted it was a pretty good sized storm of over two and a half inches, but it accounted for 17% of the dissolved phosphorus that um, was discharged into those reservoir systems. So it, um, the work that we're doing on this project, the proposed floodplain and riparian restoration, along with work with property owners to um, basically reduce the pollutants at the source, at source control, um, that work will reduce the amount of nutrients delivered to the reservoirs and build resiliency to climate change. Um, and this one photo just really, these two photos really show that really market difference. We're looking at the same um, Berkeley Avenue culvert. Um, one, the top photo taken um, in July this year, um, and the bottom one, a typical rainstorm um, where the culvert is completely full and um, chock full of um, sediment filled water. Next, please. So this project builds upon ongoing watershed protection and stormwater management efforts by both the Quidnick Land Trust and Town of Middletown. Um, Quidnick Land Trust has invested a lot of um, uh, land uh, conservation right purchase and outright land um, purchase in this watershed as well as other watersheds of the Newport water supply system. Um, and the town has also done a lot too in terms of um, advancing its um, management of stormwater from its roads and uh, facilities in the watershed. Um, this design concept um, that we, that was the start of this project was actually proposed in the Maitred River Conservation Plan that was prepared for Quidnick Land Trust by Fuss and O'Neill in 2017. And this graphic um, depicted our, our starting point for the project. And it's what we shared with the property owners um, when we asked them for um, their approval to allow for um, additional um, field assessments to be done on their property to help advance the design and engineering for this project. Um, next slide, please. So um, we had um, crews from Fuss and O'Neill and Interfluve and Save the Bay um, out in the project area on September 21st. And here's some of the observations from their um, field assessments. Um, they observed that the stream is already evolving to form meanders and scour pools, and it's basically mobilizing sediment downstream. Um, they observed that the, dry, the channel, the river channel, was dry throughout the, the project um, area, and that the soils were also dry in the floodplain. So it was, we, it was a dry summer. We all experienced that, and um, the channel was dry for six or eight weeks not throughout the channel, but in the area of our project. Um, they also observed heavy sediment deposition in the stream bed and on the floodplain, um, upwards of four feet in some places. Next slide, please. And that there were also numerous invasive species on site. Um, and then um, they also observed that the stone wall, which runs along um, Berkeley Avenue, and um, several large willow trees along the West um, Channel Bank between Green End Avenue and Tally Ho Court are being undermined by erosion. And their opinion was that if nothing's done, um, there could be you know, complete undermining of both the stone wall and the, those large trees. Next, please. 
So um, we have been um, working to um, take those field observations um, as well as um, looking at historical topographic maps and um, modeling to evaluate various floodplain restoration designs um, to look at both their flood mitigation and their water quality benefits. Um, this graphic on the right just depicts um, one of the outputs from um, the model that was used um, that basically just shows how the river uh, kind of jumps the bank. And because there's um, insufficient capacity under the Berkeley Avenue um, in Berkeley Avenue culvert, um, so it kind of jumped out of its um, its channel and makes its way around and eventually back into the river, but you know, flooding the road and property along the way. Um, so it was outputs such as these that have really helped to um, design the preferred alternative that we've um, we are recommending. Next, please. So I will apologize right up front for the small scale of this, but it's the best we can do, unfortunately, with um, being virtual and looking at our screens. Um, this is a depiction of um, the project area. So again, just to give you bearing, um, on the, the top of the slide is a longitudinal view of the project area. On the left side is um, the, the north end of our project area, which is just north of the um, Berkeley Avenue overpass on Mayford River. Um, and going all the way to the right um, brings us to the Green End um, Avenue intersection. And um, the little, the box, which is um, identified by that fuchsia, fuchsia box, um, the graphic below is a blowout of that particular area um, of, this um, project area. So I'll describe the, the preferred um, design um, on two slides. I have one for the north, the southern um, project area, but this is the northern. So um, to begin, the in the northern reach, there's no change in the alignment of the river that's proposed, but we are proposing to um, create some sinuosity or meanders in the river. Um, that basically extends the flow path and it slows the river down a bit and it provides a bit more um, flood storage, basically, you know, room for the floodwaters to be. Um, we also are proposing that um, upland area adjacent to the river would be excavated to create a floodplain. Um, so basically it allows for a controlled, it controls the area of flooding um, within that area. And um, it's proposed that that would be about 80 feet in width in total. And it likely, you know, um, you know, split be on either side of the river, but that is all, you know, to be determined by in the final design. Um, we also will um, be replacing the culvert at Whitehall Road. Um, what has been discovered is that the bottom elevation of that culvert is actually higher than the bottom elevation of the Berkeley Avenue culvert. And what that does is that it creates backwater flooding in this area. So we're going to replace the culvert on Whitehall Road, lowering it um, so that it's no longer at a higher elevation than its upstream crossing. And we also will be um, excavating the stream channel depth up and downstream of that culvert to basically bring it to that same elevation, that new lowered um, elevation of the culvert under Whitehall Road. Um, there is a potential that we would um, need to replace the Berkeley Avenue culvert to provide for greater um, capacity and or to install floodplain relief culverts there. Um, and then lastly, because the model sh has shown us that the river, um, it will uh, run out of, we're, we're trying to design um, increased flood storage and remove things that are causing bottlenecks so that it won't do this, but it will, the river you know, flows out of the bank and then goes into that area on the east side of Berkeley Avenue. And so we're looking at the possibility of installing a berm or a deflection berm 
that would basically allow for temporary storage of the water in that area, which is kind of a wet um, shrubby area. Um, and the water would eventually recede back out it back into the channel at the Berkeley Avenue um, underpass. Um, next, I think that, oh, and then the, lastly is that Berkeley Avenue would be raised by um, approximately two feet um, to again, prevent flooding of Berkeley Avenue. Uh, next slide, please, and I'll describe the southern portion. So this is the area that's south of Whitehall Road um, to the Green and Avenue intersection. And in this portion of the um, project area, the river flows right adjacent to um, Berkeley Avenue and the stone wall. And so um, here the river would be realigned. It would be moved away from Berkeley Avenue. Again, we would look to add sinuosity and floodplain storage. So excavating upland areas to create more storage in a controlled way. So that when it does flow out of the banks, it's in, it's in an area that's been vegetated and planned for that to happen. Um, I think those are the, I talked about the, the raising of the um, Berkeley Avenue. So all of these features that I've talked about um, will all be basically the next step is to do more detailed modeling and to go through an iterative process to look at um, which features provide what benefit from a flood mitigation perspective. And by controlling the flooding, we also are getting water quality improvements because we're not having the flooding of um, farm fields or areas that aren't intended to be flooded. We would be creating an intentional area for the river to flow um, when it exceeds a certain um, flow um, level. Um, next slide, please. So our next steps are, this was phase one of this project to come to a, a recommended preferred alternative. Um, that has been presented to the property owners as Sean explained and, and um, we are looking for their endorsement of this preliminary design to go to the next step. Um, basically we wanna make sure that there's nothing that's a showstopper um, with them. And same with the town council, you know, looking for endorsement as the project sponsor. Um, the town would be the sponsor. It wouldn't be the individual property owners um, clearly, nor would it be a Quinnick Land Trust. The town is really, um, it's the, the proper sponsor for this project. Um, we plan to submit a wetlands verification form to DEM. And in so doing, we're able to have a sit down with them early on in the process to just talk about the project, get their input and concerns at an early stage and not wait until we've got a final design that we're presenting to get approval for the permits. Um, we will be, um, the SNAP network will be contracting with Fuss and O'Neill as we have done in this first phase um, to under, undertake the detailed modeling, engineering and final design um, and to prepare the permit ap application ultimately. Um, again, at no cost to property owners or the town. Um, the, we would be, it, you know, the next step would be obviously do all of that and then do our work um, and then be presenting the final design um, to the property owners and to the town council. Um, and if it's acceptable, then we'd be looking for the property owners to basically provide written approval for the town to submit um, the necessary permits to DEM. Next, please. So this project, we, we don't have really refined, we don't have a refined cost estimate at this point. It's, um, we have some very broad um, order of magnitude costs that have been prepared by Fuss and O'Neill but we know it's a multi-million dollar project. Um, so it's not too early to be thinking about how are we gonna pay for this? Um, so the first pot of money that's been a, a bit made available in addition to this, this, um, the services that are being provided the, by the SNAP network is that the Rhode Island State Conservation Committee um, got a regional conservation partnership program grant back in the summer and um, that will make funding available for the Eastern Rhode Island Conservation District to support implementation of this Maple River Restoration Project. 
Um, so it can go into the actual implementation of this project that we're designing. It can also um, assist ongoing, provide ongoing assistance to farmers to install best management practices to um, control any sediment or other pollutants coming off their property and any identified water quality impacts. Um, that grant is a natural resources conservation service grant. Its total amount is, uh, I think it's a million 70. 500,000 of that is match from the Rhode Island Department of Transportation who um, is providing match in uh, for the project and in exchange they get credit towards the consent decree that they have with EPA um, for non-compliance on their stormwater permit. So it's it's definitely a win-win for the town in that um, upwards of a, over a million dollars would be made available at, again, I, my understanding is no cost share from the town. Next, please. Um, in addition, um, this net network um, will be providing the town financial assistance to look at both funding and financing um, opportunities. Um, so Joanne Throw will be the person who will take the lead on this part of our assistance. And she'll be exploring federal, state, and philanthropic um, grant opportunities and looking at um, ways to leverage the current funding that is available. She'll also be looking at financing opportunities. So the difference from funding and financing is funding is a one-time grant, whereas financing is you know, typically revenue-based. Uh, revenue um, and so she will be looking at ways to engage the private sector and private capital as well as exploring innovative financing such as pay for performance, pay for success and environmental impact uh, bonds. And that will all be presented in recommendations for long-term sustainable financing for this project and other environmental projects that the town may be undertaking. Um, we would hope that the town would be, um, Sean and, and others participating in the project would engage in financing forums and discussions with other like-minded New England communities. Um, and learn from peers, clearly. Um, there's that opportunity with the SNAP network. Next, please. And that's the end. Um, just wanna thank you for your time and your attention. Um, I have to say that the funding is made possible by a grant from US EPA to New England Environmental Finance Center. Um, and if there's time, I'm happy to answer questions. And if I can't answer your question, I will seek the answer and um, get back to you. But we can stop sharing screens so everyone can see each other. Great, thank you. Elizabeth, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna open it up. Does any councilors have any questions of Elizabeth, Vice President? Hi, Elizabeth. Paul. How are you? Good. Happy New Good. Year. So I have a lot of questions, unfortunately, but um, you know, I guess I, I, I guess the first one is, you know, one of the things you talked about is is phases. We know we have a problem there. We've had a problem there for for years and years and years. Forty years, I think I told John on August seventeenth meeting, and so you mentioned phases. So. You know, as I listened to the president, what read the presentation last night, and I was listening to you today, and you mentioned about reload. One of my questions is about raising the road and relocating the the portion of the river, um, and then to the depth of new depth of the uh, culvert at uh, at Whitehall Road, you called it, and then you said very subtly excavating to the same depth. How far is that? If you're relocating it, you're basically making a new, new river, right? A new, a new path for the river. Is that what you're talking about? So on the north side, the, the north end of the project area, it's the same alignment. There's no change in the river alignment. Um, in the south end, there would be. Um, and I think it's a, a, a foot or two, and that I can't, that's a, a question for our engineers, but it's not a huge excavation of the channel. It's enough to get it down to the same grade as the um, the new bottom elevation of the culvert at um, Wayhall Road or Berkeley Avenue yeah. extent, whichever you call it. Yeah, the reason I asked that because if you if they were going to if we're going to potentially, you know, move a portion of that the the river, and we're going down a little deeper. 
maybe we should do that first before and see what the results are before we have to spend money on raising a road two feet, you know, probably a half a mile or whatever it is. Yeah. No, it absolutely, the project could absolutely be phased. There's, there's no reason that you would need to do, I would absolutely recommend at this point, and, you know, clearly we need to get further down in the analysis, but it seems like you clearly could um, do the road raising as a second phase of this. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, I know you said you had some just, of course, everything comes down to dollars and cents, right? So you said you had some rough costs um, and you said multi-millions or whatever you said. And that's always, that's always, you know, where do you get the money from? And you mentioned a bunch of different sources. It's a lot easier said than done. Um, and again, that would have to lend to, from, for me to support it, to more of a phase type approach. And uh, one, what's the logical steps to solve this problem? And two, the funding attached to those steps. Um, you know, because if, you know, obviously one thing's not going to solve it. Right. Um, Unless you just decide, hey, you know what, let's stop playing by some of the state rules and let's play by our own rules and let's just clean the whole brook out and see what happens before we do anything. Um, um, so the next, you know, what we would be doing in the next phase would, would get into some of that detail for sure. You know, there would be a recommendation on, we could make recommendations on phasing and we are hoping to get, um, better cost figures than what we have now. Some of the costs are, are, well, not some, a portion of the uncertainty on the cost relates to the quality of the material that would be excavated to create the floodplain area and in the realigned river segment, um, river channel. Um, if, it's, if the sediment is polluted and it has to be disposed of as polluted sediment that raises the cost. If it's not, then it can be reused on site and otherwise disposed in a less expensive yeah. way. Yeah. And maybe if maybe if one of the first two steps that we took maybe alleviated a lot of the problem, maybe there wouldn't be a court, maybe it wouldn't be a need for the floodplain. I don't know. Um, the other thing is uh, there's a couple of projects going on to the north of that on the uh, Hoogan Dawns and on, I believe it's town property. Um, where we've had retention ponds that we've designed that caught no water. So I, I, I'm, I'm assuming that's been fixed. And then there's one that's caught all kinds of water that doesn't release. Is, does, that, does this project take that in those, what's going on to the north into consideration as well? Because the idea, most of that water flooding comes down from some private property, as you, as you know, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. So if that water is slowed down, does it, maybe change and those projects work. So I guess the first question is, have, have you taken that into consideration as part of this preferred alternative? And if so, um, if some of those projects finish on the north end and private property first, does that change our scope of work on the south end of the project and obviously the cost? Yeah, so um, those um, projects on Hugendorn um, are addressing the there's a sediment there's sediment basins and um, vegetative waterways that were installed to reduce the sediment load off from that property and to meter the um, floodwaters out. Um, so um, even with that completed, um, there would still be need for this project. Number one, um, and um, the the modeling will be able to take into consideration what that those projects. So okay. that will be considered. All right, thank you. I think that um, um, we all want cleaner water, right? So, um, and stop flooding. So um, if we can accomplish both, that's great. But for me to be able to support it, I'd like to, I wanna know, I'm not gonna support something that we have no idea what the cost is gonna be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and how we're going to pay for it and phase it, or maybe what those phases are. So I would like to see a little bit more information as far as uh, the, that goes to be able to, to, to figure out. I just don't want to say, okay, let's go do it, but we have no idea what it costs. We have no idea where the funding is going to come from. So that's not, yeah. to me, that's, not how we, that's not how we do things here. 
No, and I think what we're looking for is just an endorsement to go to the next step. We understand there's all sorts of questions. Every, you know, everyone's got questions and, and it's really that there's not, you know, a, a game stopper here. That's, that's really, you know, that it looks like we're, you know, on firm footing and going in the right direction and let's go to the next step and get more, um, you know, the answers to the questions that people have um, come up with a final design. So n nothing that you would do to say you endorse this project, the preliminary design would say you're endorsing the project as a, in its final. Um, it's a stepwise fashion, you know, approach that we're taking here and trying to be as transparent with, you know, no, what we're I, finding. I certainly appreciate that, but when the amount of money that's required to fix this, um, you know, you wanna make sure that you, you proceed with caution. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Just one sec. Um, I think one of the things that's really appealing about this project is that not only are we looking at a natural solution, sort of with an innovative look at uh, how we're addressing the water going through that area, but um, for the past several years, uh, Liz and her team have been talking about how there, there are some innovative finance tools that are available that don't necessarily uh, hit the taxpayer bottom line. Um, there's, there's a number of financing, you know, uh, vehicles, instruments that are used in other parts of the country. Um, and we have an opportunity to really be one of the first communities in Rhode Island to access those things where people are looking for, uh, to make investment because they need environmental credits for other operations they have in other communities. Uh, so this is a real opportunity to bring in those outside dollars that, have a direct benefit to the town of Middletown, um, really um, to benefit someone else. They're, they're, they're taking advantage of uh, <clears throat> uh, an, an alternative to other investments they, they might need to make in their operations. Um, Long-term, I think without really making a, a push for, um, you know, towards this project, uh, we're going to miss out on an opportunity to look at how we can afford to address the Bailey Brook after we deal with Mayford River. I mean, really the two big issues that we have on our plate. So, um, you know, I, I think, and, and the risk, I think that's concerning you right now isn't there because um, again, going back to the beginning of, of the presentation, uh, when we leave tonight, you know, there will be a, a transparent process that continues, but we're working through design and engineering and the modeling. We're working through permitting, bid documents, and also a, a budget. But then, but then we stop again. We're sort of at another really big checkpoint with the town council. And hopefully we, you know, I keep you informed. Mm. Not really, I hope, but I will keep you informed so that you and the, the neighborhoods that are impacted have that information as we continue to work through the problem. And Elizabeth's been an exceptional project manager in that regard. And uh, it really is a, a real dynamic group of people that have been, that have been brought together to, to address this. Uh, there's a lot of motivation. And as much as it's a, a, a problem of solving the water quality issue, it's also financing it. It's a, it's a real comprehensive solution. So I, I just wanna really sort of stress that I think all of your concerns are being addressed on this, that there's there's no race to come up with half a solution. It's to come up with a whole solution that's right for the community. So Sean, when will you um, um, bring us up to speed on the financing, potential financing opportunities with the environmental um, credits that you just spoke about? So our goal is to have the project of permitting uh, in nine months, Elizabeth, is that what we're Yeah, thinking? I mean, we're uh, hoping to finish this by in this federal fiscal year, if we can, which is the end of September, but certainly by the end of the calendar year. So three I'm to six months, I would say, Paul. Okay. <laughs> also, Toronto. Right along that, Sean, how much resources is it going to take from the town to participate in this? People time. Uh, right now, it's an insignificant, it's not insignificant time, but a small amount of time for myself and Warren Hall. Uh, the bulk of the resources is being provided directly by the SNEP network. And when you guys say farms in the area, 
again, we're working with the nursery up there and we've got two stormwater runoffs that have been put in. And as Paul's alluded to, I was up there actually this weekend looking at it. One of the ponds is filled to the top and the other pond has absolutely no water in it. Is there a problem with that, the water retention pond to the north? And is that why we're building another one to the south? So the town's not building any ponds. These are all, this is a project that was designed by NRCS for the Hugendorns. And as Elizabeth talked about, it's primarily a project that's designed to reduce the sediment and the agrochemicals that are coming off of the nursery property. And the volume of water is significant. So, um, and, and Warren may need to chime in here a little bit, but the, the pond on the upper part of the property Water is going through it, it is catching sediment, but it quickly dumps that water out. And the pond that you're seeing at the bottom, uh, that's where the water is ultimately, that's the last place that it's being held. Um, if you're to, to look at the bottom of that pond, there's two gravel baffles in the, the pond so that when the water goes through it, uh, the water, the, the sediment is basically, uh, some of it, hopefully most of it is removed from the water before it's discharged into the Mayford River. Well, we don't, we won't know that because it's not working today. We're, we're re-engineering it right now, right? No, it's working today. Uh, we, we, uh, we connected the pond to the Mayford River over just before the first of the year. So that pond and that system is connected to the Mayford River now. I heard that we had to re-engineer it. Maybe I got misinformation. It sounds like misinformation. Well, aren't, aren't we doing some work out there right now, digging deeper and doing some additional work right now? No, we connected, we connected the, the lower pond to the Mayford River. That's, that's what we did. We installed two catch basins and we connected a pipe to those catch basins and we daylighted the water to the Mayford River. But we're not re-engineering the system on the Hugendorn property. Uh, we're making no changes to the Hugendorn property. Sean, I thought it was you who told me that it wasn't working. We had to go back out and do some additional work. I, I just explained the project. Again, and Warren can tell me. He'll tell you the same thing. I, I'm good, Warren. So, um, <clears throat> thank you, Dennis. Um, the pond to the north that you talked about was on. That's the pond that's on town property. That drains dry because it does have a low flow orifice that's down deeper than the pond to the south. So you don't see any. You don't see most of the water that's retained in that northerly pond. There is, there is a certain amount of residual that's in that pond. The pond to the south has approximately three feet of um, water, a permanent pool in the bottom of it. So three and a half feet or so of water. I'm not sure exactly what that number is right now, but that's how that was designed to hold water and allow for the sediment to filter out over a longer period of time before it's introduced back into the into the Mayford. It doesn't have that lower low flow orifice is what we call it. What's the work we're doing out there today? Today, we were crossing the driveway at 233 Berkeley Ave, the Holland property. We delayed that work because of the holiday. So we went out today to complete it. There's two 18 inch pipes that are going underneath the driveway and restoring the driveway. Um, and that will lower the elevation that that pond drains to by about 10 inches. Today will uh, we'll make a difference, not a huge difference, but it will make a difference of approximately 10 inches. Cause it's been going on for a little while now, right? I mean, we've been working on that for a little bit. seems like there's some pretty big digging going on over there. That's all. Uh, the project like Sean explained is two catch basins. It's about 200 feet of pipe. Um, <laughs> We had to go back and tie into the uh, to the pipe to the area that was left by the original contractor on the Hugendon property. We tied into that area. Um, so I believe it's been about five days, one work week's worth of work that that uh, East Coast has done out there for us. And is the town paying for that? Yes, town pays for that. And that was part of the original project uh when this came in uh from hugendorn uh the hugendorn's investment is is hundreds of millions of dollars to uh make the investment on their property 
the original project contemplated a connection to the Mayford River, which would be funded by the town. Okay, and then uh, one of the things that was mentioned during the presentation, and Elizabeth, thank you very much for your time today. That's a lot of good detail in there. And I have a lot of questions too. I'm just getting familiar with it. When I got on the town council, I know it was a very stormwater runoff was number one on our list as a town. And I know that we've got a number of stormwater runoff containers that, you know, we retain water and, um, you know, try to slow it down and, and mediate the uh, flooding. I mean, millions and millions of dollars the town has spent. And so and I, I know during conversations, we talk about, is it really working? What we already did, is it working? We haven't gotten any detail on whether it's working or not. Um, any great detail. So yeah, we're looking to invest more. And so I'd really like to get some information on what we can actually feel like it's going to work. I mean, that Berkeley Road is gets washed out. And we've replaced that road a number of times. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, trying to alter a river is to me, Mother Nature goes where it wants to go. I mean, we can go and start digging and it doesn't mean it's going to work. Yeah, I mean, that's why we've assemb- assembled the team that we have, frankly. Um, you know, Interflu, if you can go on on um, the internet and, um, and Google Interflu LLC, they're a top-notch um, river restoration firm. This is what they do. They've done, you know, um, thousands of projects all over the country in four continents. Um, so... You know, this is not a this is not a pristine watershed. I mean, it's still th- something like thirty five percent agricultural. So you know, it's <laughs> it's not overly developed, but it's been manipulated. You know, it's if you go back and you look at um, old aerial photos or old um, topographic maps, there's been a lot of development and a lot of manipulation of of this watershed, and so. Um, you know, it's, it's, this is kind of a course correction, frankly. Um, and, you know, if you, if you choose not to go forward with a project, um, there will continue to be flooding on Berkeley Avenue. There'll be, you know, continued um, water quality impacts. You know, I think, as I mentioned, the, the impacts to the Newport water supply reservoirs are significant. Um, those reservoirs have cyanobacteria blooms that occur on a pretty routine basis. I don't, I don't think there was one this year, but I know that there was one last year in November. Um, and these, this watershed is a significant source of nutrients into those reservoirs. And because of the way that Newport manages their system, water from these reservoirs go into, you know, gets pumped to two others on its way to getting to um, the treatment plant, treatment plant number one. So. It's, it's an issue and, and fixing this issue, fixing this problem, reducing the amount of um, flooding, which also, as I mentioned, there's water quality benefits of not having this scouring of um, when it flows out of its bank or it's scouring the, the, the bank. Um, there's real benefit, there's real flood mitigation and um, water quality benefits of doing that. And I, you know, I hear your point that you've put a lot of money into stormwater management. I hate to tell you, you got to spend more. I mean, it's, you're not done. And, you know, Middletown is an absolutely beautiful town, but you happen to be the host to what, four of the Newport water supply reservoirs. And um, that means that there's a lot of res- responsibility on the town to manage the stormwater that's going into those, you know, from town property, town roads and other facilities into those reservoirs. And this is, this isn't a stormwater project per se, but it's complementary to the work that the town's been doing. Yeah, and just two things and I'll turn it over. Just, I would agree with Paul, you know, the whole area was dried out this summer for quite a long time. And could we have gone in and pulled some of that sediment out while it was all dry? in there you know that runoff I mean mm-hmm. it's sitting right there I don't know why we don't take it out put it in a truck and get rid of it and see if that would you would you would be in violation of the Clean Water Act and the Freshwater Wetlands Act and you get hit with with a fine and it would not it's not something the town wants to have on its record that you've gone in and just bulldozed taken yeah, a bulldozer to a river channel that. that's not a good move according to Paul that's what we used to do so I guess they changed the rules on us so 
Well, 1972, the Clean Water Act was passed and uh, there's been lots of other, you know, the Freshwater Wetlands Act was passed in 77, I think. And so there's been a lot of, you know, environmental regulations, mm -hmm. laws and regulations that have been established. Yes. Yeah, we always get hit with regulations and maybe this is a conversation we should bring Newport Water into as well, since it's affecting them. So thank you. You're welcome. Councilor, uh, Councilor Santos and then Councilor Welch. I have one quick question regarding Berkeley Avenue, the raising of Berkeley Avenue. Has there been any time element set on doing that? What part of the year and what year? No, that, that's, we're not anywhere near having right. an answer to that. That's, that's my yeah. question. Thank you. Yep. Council Wolf. Hi, uh, I'd just like to ask uh, north of all of this, where a lot of this flood water originates, not counting Hugendorn, because that's being addressed by the two uh, ponds that have recently been put in. Uh, so on the north side of Wyatt Road, in the base of the vineyards and what was old farmland there is where all this watershed comes from. So the pond behind the rifle range that is way overgrown, that affects the flow of the Mayford and secondly, just adjacent to that on the east side is uh, an old cornfield that is slated to be uh, irrigation for the golf course. Mm -hmm. Acres, uh, I wanna say 10 or 11 acres, the size of the pond was slated to be. So if you were to uh, not only slow the water by using those two ponds, but then the golf course were to use some of that water, that would mitigate some of the issue downstream. So is that, um, is that being considered at all? You know, so our project, um, I see your point that, you know, to look holistically, to look at where is this water coming from? What's the source of the floodwaters? And let's see if we can manage that in a way that is perhaps less expensive. Um, our project area is focused in that, you know, in the the Berkeley Avenue area where the flooding occurs, and um, we have not, you know, so we're looking at, you know, what are solutions for what's coming down? What are solutions of how we can manage those floodwaters using nature-based solutions? Um, we haven't gone into the further north of there, and in, in part because um, that's, you know, one of the first concentration points where the flooding is really a pro is the problem. So that's where we, we, and that was from earlier modeling that was done by Fuss and O'Neill as part of the conservation plan that they did for the Quinnick Land Trust. And I understand that. Um, I certainly get that you're dealing with the section that you've been given. My question just is, it may be a whole lot cheaper and easier to deal with it in already open farmland rather than roads and culverts and changing the river and everything. You're dealing with the result than where it starts. Yeah. I mean, I'll bring it back to our team to look at that again. I mean, I, I that came up in, in some of our conversations, we have talked about that. Um, and it, and unfortunately Dean's not on the, the, um, the call tonight that he could help answer this question, but I will go back to the team and we'll talk about that. And um, I'll, I'll try to give you something in writing in response to that. Thank you. Yep. Right. Also, Flood. Um, thank you, Mr. President. So I'm, I'm cautiously fascinated with this whole concept. I really didn't know that you could alter nature in such a way. And with the expertise that has come together in this team, it's actually pretty fascinating to me. Um, one of the questions I have for you, Elizabeth, is the title of the PowerPoint is the presentation of the preferred alternative. And that just leads me to, to wonder what were the other alternatives and sort of jumping on the phased approach from uh, Councillor Rodericks, you know, are there some things that may not be this entire change that could be considered that 
um, you know, we could, we could also work for the area and for Middletown. Yeah, so the other alternatives that we looked at were um, components of, um, of what ended up being the recommended. So there, we looked at um, not, not realigning the river channel, so not moving the channel at the south end of the project, not adding, um, I think all of them, all of them had, all alternatives we looked at had the lowering of the um, Whitehall or Berkeley Avenue extension um, culvert because that has been identified as causing this backwater um, effect, which causes the flooding, one of the sources of the flooding. Um, but we basically looked at um, variations on moving the river or not moving the river, add, adding meanders or um, or just the floodplain, um, adding the floodplain. And the only alternative of those that um, was actually effective at at all in mitigating the flooding was this one that involves creating meanders and floodplain to the north and create moving the river to the south and creating meanders. But with that alternative, we, you know, we, we looked at that and then we still were seeing flooding of Berkeley Avenue. Um, and we also from the modeling saw how the river and it's matched by um, observation, um, in-person observation that the river, um, you know, circumvents the Berkeley Avenue um, culvert and makes its way to the east and then further south rejoins the river. And so that's where we thought, oh, if we, you know, are able to put berms there, we prevent that flooding, that additional flood um, effect on, um, on the road. And then the last component, the last alternative that we looked at was this road raising. So in essence, we combined um, three alternatives into the preferred alternative, because that's the one that's the most effective at mitigating the flooding on the road and improving water quality. Um, so certainly it could be phased. And I think that once we get, you know, the, the road raising can be done certainly at a later point, it seems at this point anyways. Um, and um, when we get to the next phase and get into, we did one dimensional modeling with this first round, we're gonna be doing a more sophisticated modeling, two dimensional, um, and just really doing, as I said, like an iterative design process where um, we'll look at the, ben the flood mitigation benefits and the water quality benefits and habitat benefits from these different alternatives. Um, so it, it didn't even, the others didn't have um, the improvements that would warrant them being used even, um, you know, partially. So, I mean, to Dennis Toronto's point of, you know, we put all this money and we don't see any benefit that would, you know, people would be saying, oh, we spent all this money, we don't see any benefit. So we're trying to get to a solution that we, from, you know, the best information that we have from the modelers and the experts says this should fix it or at least reduce the, the frequency and, and magnitude of the flooding. So, so mitigation one, if, if um, applied, you would still get flooding. Mitigation one plus two, if applied, you would still get flooding. Mitigation right. one, two plus three, finally, we, we address the flooding and it goes With away. With three, four, and five, we address the flooding. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, so that, but that being said, it like you said, the road could be raised later if we tried, you know, one, two, and three, and maybe from um, that holistic view, something's going on that does not create as much, you know, downstream flow. Um, then that we could stop there and not have to, you know, sell the farm, so to speak. Yeah, just as a potential. Yeah, I mean, yes, absolutely, and you know, I think. Back to Tom's point about are there other ways that you can have beneficial, you know, basically create beneficial uses so that you create some kind of flood storage that also can be used for irrigation purposes, for example. Um, we did talk about that too, and I don't think it's off the table for within this like project area that we're talking about. Um, but I think that there's certainly 
um, you know, potential opportunities down the road to, to consider other, you know, other opportunities, so. Um, thank you, Elizabeth. I have a question, Sean, for you. Uh, I, I, you know, the uh, water traffic study just got presented by the planning department. And I didn't know if any of this overlapped with, with that study as far as uh, ac actions to take. I'll have to look and I can get back to you. Okay. I just didn't know if this should go, you know, to see if there's a, between the two studies, if there's something that should be done like right away to, to help out. And another thing I noted in the study in that presentation is, and Elizabeth alluded to it, I think that we are 70% of what goes into the Newport water supply or something, something very large along those lines. And for financing, it seems that national or Newport water or the state would you know, also help. I understand that RIDOT, RIDOT's involved, but, you know, there almost should be maybe, you know, other community contribution uh, since this is everybody's water that we are protecting. Just a thought. Well, there certainly are, um, there are grant funds available, um, you know, at the state level, and that's something that we would certainly, you know, um, be, as part of our financial assistance, be looking at if there's opportunities that are really, you know, well suited to this. So, okay, thank, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, um, one of the most appealing parts of your presentation to me when I read it over was the, um, the seeking and the uh, endorsing of the property owners mm -hmm. and the, uh, the part where the final design would be presented to the property owners. And if acceptable to them, owners would be provided uh, with a written approval to submit the necessary permits to DEM at no cost to the property owners. And that's really appealing because I think there shouldn't be any cost to our budding property owners. But taking it one step farther, for me to sign off on this, I want to be, I want to be assured that, you know, this isn't going to be, oh, well, it didn't work. And we end up creating some more problems because of it. I mean, I traveled that road you know, almost on a daily basis 50 years ago, going to work every day. And I saw that road um, at times being two feet wouldn't have been enough to raise that road. You know, and I think things have gotten better over the years uh, with the work that has been done down there, but to eliminate it um, totally without reinventing the wheel down there, which part of your design is reinventing the wheel. Um, I don't think you're going to be able to do it. And I think Councillor uh, Wells brought up a good point. You know, if we can stop it from where it's coming from, that's filtering down into the area, that's creating the issue, that's where you ought to be concentrating to. But uh, I just want to, for me to sign off, I just want to make sure that, number one, that it's not going to, our budding property owners are going to be pleased and sign off with it. But I also want to make sure that it's presented to them and not, and please don't take this the wrong way. Not that I want to as accurately as possible of the potential outcomes of any design changes down there, because I don't want to create problems for our property owners. I want to eliminate it. So. Oh gosh, yes. No, <laughs> believe me, we are on the same page with that. And Good. you know, that's again why we have. I think we have an excellent team. Good. Lots of great experience, and that's why in this next phase, the modeling um, will be used to make sure that we're not creating other problems. Great. You know, so. Elizabeth, again, thank you. Oh, you're uh, welcome. Does any councils have any follow-ups? We have uh, other items on the docket tonight. Vice President. Yes, Bob. Thank you. So, just a couple things, Elizabeth. If Part of that, where part of that uh, is being rerouted, the, potentially the, the brook, uh, the river, um, what happens to the old part? Do we still use it or is that, is that what do we do with that part of it? Um, I'm assuming that that would be filled in and then, um, you know, graded and um, stabilized and 
you know, made into field or, you know, allowed to be. Yeah, maybe some, some, some improved pedestrian area, you know? Um, yeah, it's, well, it's private property. So that's all. No, along the brook I'm talking, along, along, along uh, Berkeley Avenue. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's all private property. The main part of the um, the project area is all on private property. I don't know so when, what the right of way along Berkeley Ave is. Okay, but. so maybe I'm not understanding. I, when when you go down Berkeley, say you're coming south down Berkeley from Public Works, and where you're going to move that into the Whitehall section, right? Instead of it going along the road, continuing along, some of it goes in, then it comes out along the road as you get towards down Green and Avenue. And that's right I along see. the roadside. I'm assuming that's town property right along the roadside. I don't know what the right away, the roadway right away is, okay. but okay. you know, the, the Whitehall Condo Association property line is right up against Berkeley Ave, I'm sure. Um, okay. Um, so here's the big question. As I sat here and listened to some of the questions and kept going through my mind was, you know, they talk about those, the blooms that end up. The cyanobacteria in, blooms. Yeah, in, in the uh, water, Newport water supply, Nelson Pond, Gardner Pond. Um, so years ago, there, there was a lot more farms in this area, on the island, but in this area. So, so now we have these problems with blooms we have a lot less farms that are a lot less nutrients now compared to the past, a lot less mm -hmm. phosphates or whatever the terms are, but now we have a problem. So what changed? Does anybody know what changed that's causing these problems now? Because we have less farms, less fertilizer, you know, back in the day when they used DDT and all that other stuff that wasn't regulated, it seems like we didn't have any problems or maybe they weren't testing for it. I don't know, but now there's problems and there's hardly any farms. So um, most of you know that I spent 30 years of my life toiling at Department of uh, Environmental Management and the Office of Water <laughs> Resources. And um, during the time period that I was there, we studied the Newport water supply system extensively. Um, and this problem with these reservoirs has been going on for decades. Um, in, I think it was 2012, 11 or 12, the Department of Health came to DEM and said, um, we need your help because we're going to require that Newport do a comprehensive study of their water supply reservoirs because they were having, you might remember, there was like extensive chronic problems with taste and odor. They were exceeding the trihalomethane um, recommended levels in drinking water. They had real problems. And Department of Health required the um, city to do a two-year study of their reservoir system. That was the first time that there was ever any comprehensive study of the reservoir system done. That was when DEM first was made aware that there were cyanobacteria blooms and the extent to which those were occurring. The city has been applying copper sulfate and other treatments to control the, um, the cyanobacteria blooms and other algal blooms for decades. So this isn't new and it's not going away. They've, you all know, cause you're paying for it in your water rates, they've put in advanced treatment, you know, basically the equivalent of a Brita filter um, to treat all of the Newport water system at both the, the, the new treatment plant at um, up north, I'm forgetting the name of it, and down at station one. Um, so you're fortunate in that you've got, you know, really good treatment um, of that system, but left unchecked, you know, going forward, there needs to be the nutrients going into those reservoirs are still excessive. Um, and so um, I'll get off my soapbox, but this yeah. is not a new problem. It's not, it's maybe it's better, but it's still not good enough. Okay, okay. And, and when on August 17th, we talked about testing and the frequency of testing. Um, Cause I asked that question and it just, I didn't get a really a satisfied answer for me anyway, that 
you know, that we're testing enough because we have on the end of Greenland Avenue, as you know, we've put in water filtration systems <laughs> and, and in other spots too, that maybe it's working. Um, hopefully it's working. Um, are we testing before, after that? Are we testing before that? To see are if you talking about the, the water filters on private property, on private no, no, wells? No, 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 on, on town property. Oh, yeah. So are we testing the water before it goes through there and after it goes through there? I, you know, just put the flooding aside for a minute. We're talking about water quality because there are a couple of different issues here. And I'm not sure we're doing that enough to see if we're getting results or not. Because yeah, I certainly, so, I'm certainly not aware of it. Yeah, so I will tell you that um, the, the number of um, stormwater treatment systems that have been, have been installed, um, they've made a dent in the overall um, uh, load of nutrients. Um, so I don't think you would see a um, a huge benefit. There should be a huge benefit seen from the Hoogendorn um, improvements, um, but the others, um, there, you know, there's there's just other sources that need to be controlled. Yeah. Okay. And I'll just leave you with this. I just think that uh, Mr. Welch has his hand up, and I thought he brought up, brought up a really good point about taking a look at this holistically. If we can divert some of this water to somebody that wants it. <laughs> I think maybe that that's what we should look at as, as, as Bob alluded to as well. Um, and that's really all I have. Thanks for your time. Sure. Also, oh, Welch. Thank you, Mr. President. Just one quick uh, thing, Paul. Clean ocean access. Uh, you could reach out to Dave McLaughlin. Um, so we did water testing on the Mayford from uh, behind the rifle range that Pond I talked about, the horse bridge there, uh, Wyatt Road. Uh, Green and Avenue and Paradise where the culvert cuts under to the uh, reservoir uh, for over two years every weekend. So those samples were dropped off and I'm, I can't tell you everything they took out of it, uh, but I know he has that information. So that would at least tell you from, you know, um, vineyard, you know, you, you can't we wouldn't be able to tell whether the vineyard had anything to do with it or not, but as it progressed down uh, Berkeley, you would have the numbers there for over two years. That's great. Okay. Vice President, you're muted. You love it when I'm muted, Bob. I do. Hey, so, <laughs> so that's great, Tom, but that information should be shared with the town so that at least we know one that's being tested in that two, what the results are and three, do we, is it worth continue to invest in that or where do we invest? It might point us in the direction where we need to be. And, and I'm, I, I'm sorry, I understand what you're saying, Paul. I, and that clean out access thing was, was volunteer. It was for their yeah. purposes. It had nothing to do with the town personally, mm -hmm. um, you know, necessarily. So all I'm saying to you is there is data available, probably limited, but that you it would at least give you an idea over a specific period of time to see <laughs> cross that with the improvements of Hugendorn and whatever else you, you could probably draw some conclusion, but not much. Thanks. Yeah, and I, I'm sorry, I would just add that um, if this project goes forward, um, to the next phase. The other thing, because this is an EPA supported effort um, and they're certainly interested in water quality improvements, um, they are um, looking for us to develop a, a monitoring plan to basically be documenting kind of before and after water quality conditions. And so um, we likely would be um, collecting samples sometime this coming year, um, we'll be doing some sampling as part of this project, doing sampling in the river. Um, and that would actually be a nice update to work that was done in 2015. There's been extensive sampling done by e URI, Department of Natural Resources. I had that one slide on their work. Um, and then DEM, when I was there, um, we uh, did 
a very targeted study of um, actually looking at, at farm contributions. Um, and uh, so there's, there's a lot of information from the early to mid 2000 teens. Um, so I didn't say that right. Like the 2012 to 2018 time period, there's a lot of sampling that was done. Um, and so we hope to do additional sampling this year that would provide a good kind of update. And then post project DE, um, EPA um, would be looking to, I'm sure, sponsor additional monitoring to be done. Um, and that would be the work that was done previously um, is all in taking samples to the lab. The work that Clean Ocean Access does, I know I am familiar with their sampling and they, um, they do good work. They, their bacteria samples are sent to the lab, but they use a colorimetric technique for their nutrients, which isn't as accurate. It gives you kind of ballpark values, but it's not as accurate as what like DEM or EPA requires, for example, for quality assurance purposes. So. Great, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, Thank you. This has gone on very long, and I appreciate your attention and interest. Okay. Well, it's an important. It's important to us. Yes. We want to make sure we get it done right. And very important. In the best interest of the taxpayers of the town. Mm -hmm. Vice President. Bob, just one more thing for Sean. Sean, I'd like to see if we can't obtain that information from Clean Ocean Access. I'd like, if they're the only ones testing. I know. I live on Prospect, and I know the bottom of Prospect and Paradise that URI has done a lot of testing there. They have a little machine there or whatever, but I'd like to see some testing upstream where these water filters have been put in to help clean up some of these nutrients and some of the plantings that we have, the town has done um, to see if it's working. Uh, because I'm not, you know, I think maybe, maybe we should maybe, maybe also look at working with some, some other property owners as well throughout the whole river to maybe resolve some of these nutrient problems before we start you know, moving the river and realigning it and doing all these things. I think, you know, I mean, how many times a year does it flood, really? Is it worth spending all that money to clean it or to get cleaner water? Yes. To to do it because it takes, you know, three or four year, times a year where it floods, maybe? I don't know. Okay. I'll ask the question again. Anything else? <laughs> Just kidding. Vice President. <laughs> Just kidding. When you say one more thing, it's no more time. Elizabeth, again, thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth. You're welcome. Spending Does it give you your patience? Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Thank Vice President. Okay, motion to uh, reconvene. Motion to uh, convene as a board of license. Act as a board second. of license. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Item number four, application of Tito's Cantina, Inc., DBA, Cantina, Tito's Cantina, 651 West Main Road for temporary expansion of outdoor service of alcohol. Motion to grant temporary expansion of alcohol for outside service. Conversation. Okay, let's have a second, then we'll have a conversation. Second, and a question. A second. Go ahead, Councilor Flynn. Uh, well, I was just curious in the... In our packets, there are two applications, and I, the umbrella question is, are these applications for uh, temporary, seasonal, will they be permanent after COVID, or is this just for the business to be able to serve in a, in a way to survive through COVID? Th those are the questions. Just for COVID. Just for COVID. It's just for COVID. So after COVID, it goes back to the way that it was. Yes. Okay, that's the, the main question. Thank you. Yeah. Council Santos. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll be very quick. Um, regarding this expansion, are they presently doing this, serving liquor outside? No. And who's, okay, no is the answer, but when, if this is granted, who's going to monitor the servers outside? Who's going to monitor the underage drinking? The same people who monitor it throughout the rest of the town of Middletown, the police department. Thank you. Vice, Vice President. Mr. Sylvia, thank you, um, President Sylvia. So, um, <laughs> um, so 
Have we had any objections to the neighbors in the in to, to the east, the back side of Tito's? No. None. None. No. Okay. I just want to make sure they they've been given the proper notification and that there's no objections. None. Okay. And that's from the clerk, Council Welch. And then I got you, Council Flynn. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, so my question to follow up with Paul is, so those of butters have been notified? They have not been notified, but temporary COVID because of the state, the state allows us to do this. So In other words, the state allows us to do this. There, there hasn't been any, any objections by them. Apparently the owners have spoken to some people, but because of the temporary COVID state of the state, it allows us to do this. We do not have to, like we would any other license, notify the butters. It's a temporary, it's a temporary license to help businesses during COVID. And and I understand that and I'm all for it. Um, I drove there today just to look at it specifically because mm -hmm. I'm not familiar with it. And the drawing that I see on the paper shows, you know, tables spaced out and heaters and everything, which is fine. Uh, but it doesn't show a structure over it. So I'm, I'm a little, I don't quite understand why in the middle of Jan or first week of January, they decide to ask for this. And secondly, if you do go to that parking lot and look at the abutters directly east, uh, the parking lot of Tito's uh, between Tito's parking lot and the abutters to the east is a five foot picket fence, which sounds reasonable, except for the fact that Tito's parking lot level is a couple of feet above the bottom of that fence. So if you were to sit in a typical chair on the parking lot, you could see right over the fence into the neighbor's yard. There's nothing to block it. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, if I were the neighbor, I would not be happy if somebody did that and didn't at least take put my input. So that's why I'm, I understand you're saying we don't have to because of COVID, but just as a courtesy. Um, I can't imagine saying okay without at least letting them know or coming up with some provision to block it. It is wide open if you've gone there. Well, that's a good point. Uh, we can make that contingent upon speaking with the abutters. We don't have to just take it as it is. We don't have to execute it as it is. But the, and I had a conversation earlier today with Council Toronto about the, the state of the state and this COVID and you know, now it's it's a push to help the businesses and it's, you know, we're in line with the guidelines. We have been since day one. Uh, this is in line with the guidelines, but we can make it contingent upon notifying the abutters, speaking with the abutters. We can just make an amendment to the, um, the motion. Council Flynn. She said she's just giving so my, my question so got answered, which was the... initially, uh, to how, how are the abutters notified and they haven't been. So in order that we don't delay the business doing business, I'm yeah, wondering if we can simply add a, a condition, so to speak, that some sort of buffer, a, a you know, tarp panel or, or some um, structure that blocks the business from the residences be um, provided by the business? No, that's a good point. The information that I got from the clerks was this, that they're doing this now, getting ready for better weather. So yeah. whether they're going to be entertaining people out in the parking lot now, uh, it doesn't appear so, but they're getting ready for the better weather. I guess they feel that the COVID state of the state's gonna be around for a while. So they're just preparing themselves in advance, but we can make this contingent upon anything you wanna make it contingent upon. Mr. President? Solissa. Uh, just to bring up one point too, this is really sort of a two-step process. The, the expansion of the liquor license, the temporary expansion has to come to the council, but the outdoor seating and dining itself, um, under the executive order that was issued allowing restaurants to do outdoor seating, um, still has to go through a staff review. There's a setback from any residential properties that they have to meet. Um, um, it has to go through zoning and, and police and fire review. So that's the whole sep separate process that will also take place as part of this. Just wanted to make sure. 
That's a very good point for clarity, but um, I can understand the point because the point is saying they're requesting temporary expansion of outdoor service of alcohol. Clearly, clearly asked for the alcohol. Vice President. I'd like to amend my motion to uh, contingent upon um, notification of abutters and um, you know some type of screening. Okay. I understand the business part of it and I support that, but I think at the same time, you know, there's a fine line there. We got to make sure our residents are protected as well. Oh, absolutely. I agree. Um, is everybody okay with that? Do you want to make an additional amendment to that? Council Welch? I just, one more question. So uh, the solicitor said this is a two part process. So what are we doing? We're saying we're okay with it, provided it, it checks off all the other boxes? Well, what I said was, or what I meant to say, um, there's two different approvals that would be necessary. One is the council approval to expand the service area for the alcohol to the outside. And then they have to get approval from the town, actually from the town administrator to uh, for the outdoor seating area itself. And, and there's a number of considerations in terms of making sure there's still adequate parking, making sure that there's proper precautions for safety of the people that are using it, proper setback from the residential neighborhood, et cetera. Um, the one thing I would mention, if you want to provide notice to abutters, my suggestion would be then, and, and hear what the abutters have to say, my suggestion would be that you then continue this because if you grant it, you're having the abutters come in and give you their position after it's already been approved. So if, if that's, if, if the council wants to hear from abutters or make sure that abutters have been notified, then my, my suggestion would be, um, number one, that you continue it till you get that input and then, um, go from there. Just so it was clear, the reason that is before the council is only for the expansion of the alcohol. Is that, is that a fair statement, Mr. Solicitor? That is correct. Okay. Because only the council can expand that. Council Flynn. I, I just want to make sure that, and to confirm, Mr. Regan, that both of the actions are temporary and end when the state of emergency ends because of COVID. Is that true? That is true. That so, is true. And, and, and in particular, the executive order that allows outdoor seating does not allow the ex the restaurant to expand seating beyond what the original capacity pre COVID was. So as that, if that capacity expands again, the outdoor seating area may shrink until you get to a point where you're back to full capacity indoors. And there is still um, setbacks from the neighbors that will, that need to be complied with. The, the executive order that allowed outdoor seating had a requirement of a setback where the outdoor seating was adjacent to a residential neighborhood. Um, I don't have so, it in front of me, but, but, but that would be part of the process of it being reviewed by the staff. So something exists though that will distance the activity from the residents because it's, it's all about quality of life. But again, in deference to the business, I don't want to hold them back uh, for notification on something that, you know, because we don't want to lose our businesses to COVID. So if, if we have a setback and we can create a condition of a, a, a tent or a screen of some sort, um, you know, make sure there's no music, or, you know, dining stops at a reasonable hour, eight, eight o'clock, nine o'clock, in case there are children's bedrooms on that backside. I think I'd rather get the the manner of doing business established and let them do business because it's COVID. I also want to bring up a point in a sense of fairness to Tito's. We have granted these already this year and we didn't require notification to the abutters. So I just want to, I just want to put that on the table. Council Welch. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, so not to drag this process down, if I could just ask the solicitor in the second phase after the council says okay to outdoor alcohol, 
is notification of the abutters part of that process? Uh, it is not. No. Okay, so I think, and given the fact that it is the middle of beginning of January, it is not adversely affecting the business yet for outside seating, especially since this drawing does not show a tent, I would be of the opinion that uh, the abutters be notified, given a chance to say something because it's not uh, time critical yet. Okay. Any other conversation? Council Flynn. So I, I just want to throw in there that whether it's winter or summer and whether the business said they were getting ready for the better weather, there's many provisions for the outside dining in winter. There are dining tents, there are heaters becoming available. Uh, I, I just don't want to stymie them, their opportunity. Nor do I, to be totally honest. I think, um, I think in fairness to them, we did this for others. I think if there's an issue, they can come back to us. Um, there's good points about the abutters. Um, I can see that, but I, I, I think, you know, we've issued these and our town administrator under the state of state of emergency has the authority to do it himself. However, he cannot authorize the alcohol to be served out there. He can, he can authorize the food service, but he can't authorize the alcohol. Um, we haven't had an issue with anybody so far. Um, I, I just don't want to, uh, I don't, I, I don't want to hurt a business that are already hurting. So, but I can understand there's valid points. So any other points? I mean, I don't know where people are on this. I'm inclined, um, I'm inclined to, uh, let this go uh, to, uh, to okay it. I do understand the point brought up about notifying the abutters. I can appreciate that. But at the same token, uh, that's something that we can be, we can address at a later time if there's an issue. Because correct me if I'm wrong, um, Mr. Solicitor, when I looked at it and it's, we can, we can pull it back at any time we want it. We can retract it. This is, this, this is an issue when you keep it until the state of the emergency is over, is it? You do have some discretion in that regard. One suggestion that I would have the council consider if you do move forward with it this evening, if screening is a concern, if you did move forward with this evening, you could do it on a condition that there be um, screening between the service area and the, uh, and the residential abutter. But that's, yeah. that's at the council's discretion. Council Toronto. We can leave that up to Sean, right? And Sean hears our concerns and Sean can, he's the one that's going to address this. We're really just passing the ability alcohol to get a liquor license at this right. point. So Sean, you know, he knows kind of what we're asking and maybe as part of his due diligence, he can see if they did talk to the abutters and if they haven't, just the council would like you to maybe, you know, would they be willing to talk with them? and also putting up the screen. And based on Sean's interview with these folks, he'll decide whether he gives it to them or not. I mean, that's a, that's a possibility. Sean, does that, I got you counsel for one, one minute. Um, uh, I, you know, the discussion tonight is loud and clear to me what the concerns are. And I certainly don't want the, the calls from the neighbors. Um, I don't think any of us no, and I think we all know the the owners of Tito's, and they've always been good neighbors. So yeah. I don't anticipate an issue talking to them and trying to make sure we can find a way so that the business and the uh, the residents can coexist. You know, through the pandemic, I think everyone appreciates small businesses trying to keep people working, and uh, the business them, themselves staying alive through this this period of time. Council Flood. Uh, yeah, one concern is apples to apples is how many of the businesses that have gotten approval, a, approval to do this are businesses serving alcohol backed up to a neighborhood, a residential, you know, neighborhood homes with families. Uh, so again, 
I, I I think I agree, and I would support it with the the screening and with maybe you know no seating after eight o'clock, something like that. Just no music, just to make sure that we do have maintain that quality of life, and we're considering our residents even and our businesses during COVID. Yeah, you can't have music, anyways. But okay. um, I, I'm fine with that. Um, Mr. Brown, do you see any problems with you executing the wishes of the council on this? Oh, absolutely not. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions on this? Okay. Sorry. No. I, I, it's very clear to me what the council wants. Okay. All right. So, Vice President, we'll do I'll the amend, motion. I'll amend the motion back to the original motion. Okay. To grant the temporary expansion of alcohol for outside service. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, signify by raising your hand. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. We have, one, we have one in opposition. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Motion to reconvene as a town council. Okay, we have uh, a motion to reconvene as a town council. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, consent calendar. Any council want to take anything off the consent calendar? Number seven, please. Number seven. Vice President? No, nah, I was going to pull seven as well, but go go right ahead, Terry. Okay. Your motion, Mr. Uh, Vice President? Motion to approve the consent calendar minus item number seven. <laughs> Any other items off the consent calendar? Okay, we have a motion to approve minus item number seven. Do we have a second? Second. I'll second it. We have a motion to second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Item number seven, communication of Sean Raymond, PE, Secretary of State of Rhode Island and Providence Plantation, State Traffic Commission, request from the town of Middletown to install a crosswalk across Aquinnick Ave in the vicinity of Newport Ave in Middletown. Motion to receive said communication. Second. Okay, we have a motion to second. Conversation. Council Flynn. Thank you, Mr. President. I just wanted to ask uh, maybe Sean Brown, maybe the council, since the planning board um, and the town council approved street scrapes, streetscapes for this area, um, should this, has this been run by the planning board to cross reference or, or alert the state traffic commission of, of their plan, which also included sidewalks? I, I, I just see there's two parallel things going on and I don't know if they should be talking or not. I'm not sure where this came from. I think the planning board, if I can answer that, I think the planning board is well aware of this. This oh. crosswalk has been in the process for a couple of years now. This crosswalk and the one around the corner from it, the Wave Avenue area has been in the, in the process with DOT for a couple of years now. But Mr. Brown, have you got anything else to add to that? No, this originated with a correspondence from one of the residents in the area. She had had asked for uh, recently the crosswalk um, which again goes back to what the council president's been pointing out that this has been an ongoing uh, request because there is no crosswalk in that area. You either need to head down towards the Atlantic Grill or you have to head up to Aquinnick Avenue itself to find the crosswalk. Uh, the second part of the request was to clean up and update the signage related to the remaining sidewalks. That's a, a different request that the town sent to DOT maintenance. So. Uh, the letter itself actually came to the council from Chief Cure, and uh, this is the notification that the State Traffic Commission is actually reviewing the matter. So uh, that's what the, the item is. Uh, we can certainly let the planning board know, but I, I think the planner is well aware of this request, and mm -hmm. I can follow up with him in the morning. I'd appreciate that, just to make sure it's in line with what the streetscapes reflect. Okay, we have a motion to receive us for the second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, item number nine, email communication from Vice President Rodriguez, uh, reference Civic Appropriation Middletown Youth Wrestling Club. Okay, motion to receive said communication. Second. Okay, a motion second to receive, all in favor? Aye. Vice President. Okay, so uh, colleagues, I, we all saw the email uh, a couple of weeks back or 10 days ago from the uh, uh, wrestling coach, uh, Claro Diamond, and um, um, the, uh, you know, with his desire to, to, to gain the uh, civic appropriation with wrestling moving forward, 
Um, I did do a follow-up last night. I called uh, Claro, and I believe he's on. I can see his, that he's on uh, to answer any questions. But um, just to make sure, given the spike in COVID, it was still going forward, it was still happening, and it is. So um, going from a midwinter type sport, it'll be, uh, you know, midwinter to, to spring to even early summer type uh, uh, extension of this program. Uh, given the uh, circumstances. So, you know, I thought it's appropriate to jump right on it. And then if these folks need the funding, uh, total cost of this program is 12,000. They're requesting civic appropriation of 8,000 8, because wrestling isn't funded uh, by the school or anywhere else. So they do a lot of fundraising with tournaments, which they haven't been able to do. Um, so um, I think at this time it's appropriate to uh, fund their request. Okay, Council uh, Flynn. Yes, and I don't know if Claro can, can get in. He may want to answer um, these questions. So I noticed that there's um, probably other people saw the article in uh, the year end paper that the athletics got delayed yet again. I think Middletown's actually starting on the 11th. I'm not sure um, how that meshes with this group if it's under the school umbrella or if they're a separate league. Um, but I did want to ask. Um, given that it's it's COVID season and we, we got the um, budget from the 2019-20 season. We didn't get a 2021 forecast. And I know that I'm looking at some of the line items. Um, there's gym rentals and car rentals and entry fees for those tournaments, hotels. I just didn't know if to what scope this season was actually looking like, because I know we have a lot of folks that have a lot of needs for resources, and I, I wanted to make sure we fund him because thank goodness he's hanging in there for our activity starved youth. I, I'm, I support that 100%. I just want to see, you know, what the this season is look is really looking like and what the need is. Okay, do we have somebody I don't have access I don't have a visual on anybody. He has, Bob, he has his hand up right now. Okay. Carlo, go right ahead if you're on. Hello, uh, this is Claro Demon, 240 Alpha in Lane, Middletown, Rhode Island. And I'm the director of the Middletown Youth Wrestling Club, as well as uh, chairman of the Rhode Island Wrestling Association. So uh, this civic appropriation has nothing to do with either uh, Middletown High School or Gaudé Middle School or any of the elementary schools. Uh, Middletown Youth Wrestling Club operates as a separate entity, uh, as a nonprofit organization under uh, USA Wrestling and the Rhode Island Wrestling Association. And uh, what we do is, uh, last year we had over 100 youth athletes, uh, two thirds of whom were from uh, we're, we're Middletown residents, and we also serviced uh, residents of uh, Newport, Portsmouth, Tiverdown, Jamestown, North Kingstown. So we, we do have more of a regional reach because the, the, there simply aren't the activities there in any of the other towns. Um, and to answer Councillor Flynn's question as far as what the season will look like this year, um, I've been in the weekly meetings with Governor Raimondo's uh, return to sports group. So I, I've been dealing with the people directly at the Department of Health, Department of Environmental Management, uh, Rhode Island Department of Education, Rhode Island Interscholastic League, as well as uh, myself re representing the Rhode Island Wrestling Association. And uh, we, we've basically been shut down for nine months since March of 2020, um, Governor Raimondo's office uh, released the final pause just last week. So we are able, we, we have had kids starting practice already. And the, the plan is to basically take, uh, we, we usually start October, November. We're, we're gonna take those seasons that were on the front end and move them to the back end. So we're gonna have a full wrestling season from uh, January till the end of the school year in June. So that's six full months of wrestling. As far as uh, traveling, we, we don't plan on traveling this year. However, I, I do have, uh, so, so there will be some cost saved there, but uh, where the money is really spent is on uh, 
the athletes uh, registration and insurance cards. It costs um, $35 per athlete to uh, have insurance so they can get on the mats. And that, that's the biggest expense overall. Um, so that, that's where the bulk of the money is going. And, and then uh, I have between 10 and 12 strictly volunteer unpaid coaches who spend uh, the full six months holding the practices um, for these. So we, we tend to cover their expenses as well as far as uh, the background checks and licensing registration, what have you. And that, that averages out to about $200 per coach. And then the, the rest of the money will basically be spent on keeping the kid, keeping the kids safe. We're going to spend the money on uh, uh, personal protective equipment, making sure we, 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 we've always uh, kept the mats clean as part of the process. Um, so we do a daily uh Matt clean. We also do daily medical checks each time they're on practice. Uh, and that, that's more of a wrestling tradition to make sure kids aren't doing, uh, passing along any type of skin diseases or what have you. And uh, the intent is to follow all of the return to play guidelines as far as uh, what the DEM and Department of Health has dictated. I, I've been told I'm allowed to have one athlete per 100 square feet. So that allows me up to 80 athletes at a time inside uh, God A gym, for example, and 25 athletes per mat. We have uh, three full mats that we can roll out simultaneously. So that gives me 75 athletes per mat. And by uh, breaking practices up into two sessions, um, I can have up to 150 athletes per night, which uh, will probably be uh, just over 100 athletes per night by the time everything's uh, fully up and running in February. D does that make sense, Counselor Flynn? Absolutely. You don't even have some of those big line items on this budget that I'm looking at, Claro. And again, thank you for all that you do for, again, our activity-starved youth. I really appreciate you hanging in there until, you know, you got the uh, checkered flag to go. Thank you so no, much. No, I, I, I'm the type I... Uh, well, my biggest concern is that none of my athletes get sick or that none of the coaches get sick. So we, we've, uh, I, I've attended uh, the governor's meetings religiously pretty much every Friday. I, I'm uh, on a first name basis with Cindy Elder from uh, Department of Environmental Management, who is directly in charge of uh, the sports guidelines and uh my personal assurance to all of you is uh, the same thing I tell myself. We're going to do this right. We're going to do this safely. And uh, we need to do it for the kids. The, the, their kids, they've been um, home from school, basically uh, doing uh, out of classroom with uh, no social contact, no physical activity. And that that's what we need to start bringing back. I, I know, it, especially... Uh, with Middletown having uh, cases of Corona or singular cases in uh, throughout all the schools. I've been following that closely as well. So, uh, and I, I've always been prepared. We, we've, we've been following all the uh, uh, contact information, uh, social distancing guidelines, mask wearing. So if we're fully prepared to meet the challenge head on. Perfect. Thank you so much again. How many people do you have in the program, wrestlers do you have in the program right now? Uh, what, what, How many what, wrestlers do you have in your program right now? Bob, you broke up a little bit. That was my question. How many, who's ever, how many wrestlers you have in your program right now? Oh, so. practice tonight. And that will increase uh, exponentially in the next once they're aware that uh, we're back up and running. 
so that that's where we need the money sooner rather than later and uh we will get them all on the mats okay also Toronto. yes i'm sorry i didn't hear him how many how many wrestlers are you uh coaching at this time uh, we had 20 wrestlers on the mats tonight, and the goal is to be back up to 100 by end of the month. Okay. I, I do a rolling, rolling registration where I don't set one date for if you miss it, you can't sign up. No, uh, that's um, the plan is to do the winter season, and as soon as the weather breaks, we're going to hold uh, outdoor practices to stay within the COVID guidelines. And ho hopefully use those new fields that you all built last year at God A. Yeah. I have one other question, Mr. Oh, President. I had my hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me, Mrs. Santos. You're not in my screen. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not on your screen. Me too. My question, my question is, of this 1760 for gym rentals, how much do they charge you for each um, time? So, uh, when we rent Gaudet, when we hold a tournament at Gaudet Gym, uh, Gaudet charges us uh, on an hourly basis. I believe it's $65 per hour to rent both the uh, gym and the cafeteria. And then uh, they, they usually have three, uh, two or three uh, maintenance crew on for the day. And then we'll usually have a tournament one, one day on Saturday, one day on Sunday. So that's why that that's uh, an expense. They didn't use to charge us several years ago, but they, they're charging us hourly now. Thank you. Also, Flynn. Uh, just a quick question, uh, Claro. If the if Gaudet were to shut down due to COVID. Do you have a backup location to run your program? Yes, we do. Uh, I use the uh, Florence Gray Center, the Boys and Girls Club of Newport, Autonomy Hill. Okay. That's uh, okay. one of our other practice sites. Great. Thank you. Paolo, do they charge you to lease the Boys Club, Jim, over there? Uh, the Boys and Girls Club... Uh, we, we have, they have not charged us rent yet, but I believe they're planning to at some point in time. That's a new uh, thing we started last year. But we, we haven't had any tournaments. There hasn't been anything to charge us for. And they're, they're happy to have the program. Okay. President? Yes, Mr. Kaiser. You said that, uh, Clara, you said that uh, if you hold the uh, tournaments on a Saturday, you pay the custodians to come in. Is that time and a half? Do you know? Can you answer that? On mute. Mute is on, he's muted. Clara, you're muted. What? What? Mute. Uh, T. Gomes on 26 Elephant does the billing, and I, I just write the check. I, I don't know what the custodians are paid. I, I just know what I'm charged. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Just one question. Um, so it sounds like you said two-thirds or most of the kids are from Middletown, which is great. Uh, I just wonder... Yes, sir. Do the other communities that you mentioned uh, kick in? No. No, they do not, Councillor Welch. Uh, the uh, bulk of the kids are from Middletown. The kids outside of Middletown, I, I welcome them with open arms because I, I'm not the type to limit it by, uh, because of your zip code. It's not the right thing to do. I'm here for the sport, not for the money or... We, we don't charge those kids. We treat them uh, the same, just out of the sense of fairness. Uh, and I understand yes, sir. wrestling, and I think everything you're doing is great. I have no problem with it. I just would ask, have you approached any other communities? Uh, 
I have not. It's always been Middletown Youth Wrestling Club. We have received uh, grants from uh, like Newport Hospital or uh, the uh, where, where else did we receive a grant from? Uh, the state opioid resources we received a couple thousand dollars from and we, we just cycled that back to uh all set thank you okay and it is called the middletown wrestling club if anything we get out of it for support and we get our name recognition anyways okay any other conversation Vice President. Just, just real quick, I, I asked them those questions last night. We talked on the phone for about 20, 25 minutes. And, you know, when I asked how many kids in the program, he said 110. I said, of course, you know, how many from Middletown? He said about two thirds. And the funding request is about two thirds. So I think it's in line with the funding request. I have no problem with this. This is a, this is a good program. And, um, I don't think if we didn't fund this program, I don't think there would be a wrestling program. Either. Right. Right. Well, I don't have a problem with it myself. Do we have a motion, Mr. Vice President? Yes. Considering we have a state champion on the council, a uh, motion to authorize said civic appropriation in the amount of $8,000 to be appropriated for the Parks and Recreation Fund. Second. I have a motion and second. Any further conversation? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Right. Thank you, all counselors. Have yourself a wonderful night. Thank you, Clara. Thank you. Thanks for all you doing. <clears throat> Item number 10, memorandum of the finance director through the town administrator, Rhode Island Department of Administration fueling station agreement. This is new. Motion to receive said communication. Second. Said memorandum. We have a motion and second to receive. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item number 11. Resolution of the Council, Rhode Island Department of Administration, Fuel and Station Agreement, authorizing the finance director to execute. Motion to pass that resolution. Conversation. Conversation. Second. We have a second. Conversation. Uh, so Council. I have a, a few questions. Council, on, Council, Council um, Welch, go ahead. Excuse me. Council Welch. Oh, I thought Terry was first. Okay. Um, and you all understand I'm new at this, but I was confused. Is this the first time that this has come before the council? It is. So I, what I don't understand is it looks like it is all the T's across the I's are dotted. It just needs a, it just needs a signature. I got a ton of questions. Is, is this how this typically goes? This is, this has been proposed by the town administrator. And he can ask any questions you want. And whether we do it or not, it's up to us. So if you have any questions for the town administrator, Mr. Well, uh, Council Wells, go right ahead. Okay. Um, I'll give you a couple first, Mr. Brown. Um, did DPW weigh in on this idea? They have. It's an idea that was originally contemplated by uh, Tom O'Loughlin while I was here and has also been discussed with the acting director, Rob Hanley. Bob Hanley, yes. So the answer is yes. Okay. So a couple of things I see, and I'll just give you an experience of mine so, so you can understand where I'm coming from. The calculations that are being used in this proposal are assuming that the tank at DBW is full. And uh, so my experience is this, you know, it was Newport Fire, so very similar tank set up in the city yard at Newport. Uh, so the tank is getting low because it hasn't been filled. Storm comes, delays the, the delivery. And we actually uh, got memos a number of times with just the city apparatus that not to follow our typical fueling procedures, but to wait, unless it was an emergency, to fill. So... Uh, I understand on a typical storm, as they're saying, a one day event, which I'm not sure if that means snow or hurricane or any kind of storm. That, that wasn't clear to me. But uh, so now you're going to send these state trucks or some percentage of them through 
the town garage, and I know everyone's familiar with where that fueling station is. Um, that is not the easiest place to access, and you're going to put that on top of all the typical vehicles that go there. So I, if you're telling me that DPW was good with it, I'm assuming that that was okayed. Uh, aren't the school buses, some school buses also fueling there as well now? They are. That's correct. So that's a lot of traffic back behind that uh, fire station tower. Um, and now you're going to throw the state vehicles in there as well. And so what happens if this is not a one day event? And what happens if we, the fuel level is not up to full? Do, does the state trucks get precedent? Uh, we would work with DOT and they would have to rely on their Portsmouth station. I, I understand that. And, and uh, so Portsmouth goes down and I understand that, you know, suppose Portsmouth fueling station goes down and our, our tank isn't filled, as I said, um, I'd have a tough time telling our residents that some of their neighborhoods uh, would have to wait because the state takes precedence. And that might sound like a stretch. I mean, you might ask what the odds are of that. Uh, but as we've seen, things with seemingly minute odds can still happen. So how, I mean, shouldn't we put a little more verbiage in there to ensure that Middletown is taken care of first? We could do that. All right. While I'm, while I'm going, I'll finish up. Um, I, I, it's probably just a typo, but when I read the cost per gallon that the state would pay over and above the cost that Middletown pays per gallon, it says 0.33 cents. Uh, in another place, it said 0.33 cents, and then it said dollars. So does that mean 33 cents or 0.33 cents? My understanding it's 33 cents per gallon. And did, did the state come up with that or did you? The state, the state proposed it. So what was your counter? The town didn't make a counter. We can make a counter if you'd propose that. Okay. I'll let somebody else have the floor. Thank you. Also Flip. You're muted, Cousin. You're muted, Terry. Is that better? My gotcha. back? Okay. Uh, so I just had a, a few things also. I was not familiar with, with this. Um, and interesting points to think about from Councillor Welch. Uh, so given the average numbers that the memo from uh, the town administrator uh, quoted for the average storm, it's about 5,500 gallons um, between the gas and the diesel. So we're talking about $500 a storm, maybe a little less if it's a small storm, maybe a little more if it's a big storm. And I'm just wondering, you know, Berkeley is a pretty sensitive area. We just heard about it earlier today, tonight. And, you know, what's the wear and tear of these big trucks going up, uh, you know, in addition to what's already going there on the, the Berkeley roadway? Um, and, you know, it begs to question if the state could throw in more for the Maidford River restoration, uh, you know, if they're going to be utilizing that road, just put that on the shelf. Um, and maybe they could pitch in quite a bit if we committed for, you know, three or five years to this memorandum of understanding. So those are just some, some thoughts about the value, you know, versus the wear and tear. Um, I also noted in uh, number three on the memorandum, the lost key card. I, I hope the $5 is a, a typo because that would hardly cover, I imagine, the administration to answer the phone if somebody lost their key card. Um, I, I just think that's really low for a replacement key card. Um, I, I was thinking maybe it should be $50. Um, I don't know if the council thinks five is adequate or not. Um, Sean, is that a number that the state also proposed or is that a standard number or is that, where did that come from? Do you know? 
the standard number the state is negotiating with. So okay, if the so council would like to increase that, we can propose that to the state. And is that something we, we talk about now amongst ourselves or this is just ideas on the table? No, I, I assume you're discussing them. So, I mean, I, Does, I'm, I'm taking notes. So we're, we're looking at additional verbiage regarding Middletown first, asking for an, uh, a fee larger than 33% uh, cents uh, for the administrative charge. And the council's looking for uh, a higher, higher replacement value for a, a lost key. Yes, uh, I, I have two more points, if you don't mind. Uh, and, and to pick up where Councillor Welsh left off on the definition of um, a storm. So according to the memo, the state would only come to Middletown during storm events. And that's only if Portsmouth runs out of fuel. And I assume this is relatively enforceable because the station is locked and you need this key card. Um, but what exactly is a storm? Uh, you know, is it a snowstorm, a hurricane, anything requiring state vehicles to be on a Quidnick Island picking up tree limbs? Um, what if the state vehicles are just here to do road work? They're doing construction on West Main and it's more convenient to go to the Middletown uh, to get fuel. Does that count? Um, you know, the, the memorandum of understanding uh, says that the state fleet requests that the state fleet be authorized to use Middletown Department of Public Works fuel depot for its state vehicles, namely for the Rhode Island Department of Transportation in times of need and or emergencies. And that's not what the memo presents. It just says emergencies. So I'm again, back to that traffic, that wear and tear, that use, um, you know, that and or should be eliminated in times of need. If it's going to be for emergencies, and if I read the memo right, if it's being presented um, to the council as for emergencies, that is what the memorandum of understanding should say, I believe. I, I open that up, of course, to the I other council. I think you can direct some of these um, questions to a uh, representative from the state who's online, online right now with us, Richard Brainless. Richard, are you online? Richard Bemos? Uh Yes, I am. Okay, um, the councils have a series of questions they'd like to speak with you in regards to. Um, so, um, Mr. Brown, why don't you, uh, you want to, um, I know you've been uh, taking notes on the questions. You want to ask some, uh, Mr. Bremlis now, or do you want the councils just to uh, ask their questions directly? You can ask them directly, that's fine. Council Welch, uh, since you started it, would you like to ask him directly yourself? Okay, thank you. Uh, so you probably listened to the whole conversation and I would not have to, I don't have to re reiterate everything if you have any answers, but I will add one while I have the floor. And that is um, when I first read it, I, I assumed probably incorrectly that it meant snowstorms and it, it does not say snowstorm anywhere. And then um, looking at the typical storm of a thousand uh, gallons of diesel and 44 trucks is 25 gallons, which I know when I plow snow on my pickup, I burn more than 25 gallons. So I don't understand that number. And the other number was 500 gallons of regular or gasoline uh, for only eight vehicles, which is 63 gallons each if it were even like three tank full. So that either tells me that you've got pickup trucks with gas motors, which I'm guessing you don't, or is that, I mean, as the state police as well, what, what vehicles would be using DPW? Depending upon the situation, um, if it was a snowstorm, you have about um, 44 diesel units and eight gasoline pickup trucks on the island. Um, primarily, they'll be fueling at the Portsmouth uh, fuel depot um, those numbers are average uh, consumption just for the island um, for those same units. Um, and, and like I said, they'd be pumping out of Portsmouth. This is really in the event that Portsmouth goes down or we have some sort of a, a large disaster. Um, typically, the Middletown Fuel Depot is a relatively low uh, consumption. It, it's only like 3,000 gallons a year. Um, and it's, it's in the proximity of your depot, from my understanding. 
Um, so this is really just a backup um, in the event that we have an issue at Portsmouth um, uh, and it's primarily DOT, so. I understand that it's primarily a backup. However, if I read it right again, uh, most, and I understand most of the trucks fuel in Portsmouth, but there are there will always be some that typically fueled up on Wyatt Road here for your state garage coming to DPW. So it's not only if Portsmouth goes down, it's just in, if everything's running smoothly and this were to go through, there would still always be trucks, a smaller number coming to Middletown. Is that correct? Uh, my understanding is that they're going to primarily fuel at Portsmouth and uh, would not be diverting to Middletown unless there was an, an emergency. That's so, my understanding of it. I, I'd have to get more clarification from the, the director, but um, that, that's my understanding. We okay. also, we also I, have a, a couple MOUs with vendors on the uh, islands um, in the event of an emergency for diesel fuel. So um, we're trying to dot all of our I's and cross all of our T's. Um, so in the event, and I know, I know I'm pushing it to extreme, but I think it certainly has happened in the past and will happen again in the future. We have a storm event that's more than a day. And uh, like any other mechanical device under the harshest conditions is when they typically go down. So it is very conceivable to have the pumping station at Portsmouth go down or maybe not the whole time, but some of the time, which would send the trucks our way. If we were at a low fuel level, my, my biggest concern is that the state then comes in and says, well, East and West Main Road and all the rest of the, the state roads take priority over Middletown. And we have this agreement with you to provide us fuel. So you're going to have to lay up some trucks until we get done what we need to. And, and I didn't see that, you know, laid out in the agreement. That piece of um, that piece of the agreement in, in the operations side, um, I, I don't really have my hands in that pot. I, I'm, I'm more um, on the asset side of it. We, we just try to allocate fuel and uh, and vehicles, but when it comes to actually moving the pieces, I'd, I'd have to refer back to DOT, and I, I don't believe they're on this call. But my understanding of it is, is like I said, Middletown would be primarily a backup in the event that Portsmouth goes down. And Portsmouth, um, you know, does have a generator backup. Uh, the equipment is new. The tanks are new. Um, it, it is in relatively uh, good shape. So this year, okay. Thank you. Also, Flood. Okay. Uh, so, um, Mr. Bremis, do I have that right? Um, so I guess um, one of my concerns, and I think this is more DOT, like you were telling Councilor Welsh, is the wear and tear on Berkeley, which is a sensitive road anyway. So you might put that on your list to talk to them about. And um, that 33 cents a gallon, I'm not sure that that is adequate. And again, I, I understand that there's a, a 10 day notice clause I'm gonna talk about um, at the end. Uh, so if we're finding that it's it's more than uh, we bargained for, you know, we can give a 10 day notice and um, maybe talk about those conditions. So I'm going to leave that one uh, aside till you talk to DOT uh, for the for the lost key card. Uh, can that be negotiated up from five dollars? Honestly, that's not even going to cover the answer of the phone call that you've lost the key card. In terms of the admin fee and the um, fuel key card, uh, I'm going to refer back to um, DCAM and the Department of Administration. Um, I, I can't give you an answer right now, and um, I, I certainly can't uh, negotiate that now on this call, but I, I can come back with an answer at a later date. All right, and then that there's that, that essence um, of the memorandum of understanding. Uh, it's the third whereas of in the document where it says in times of need and or emergencies, uh, you know, I don't want it to blur with the convenience if you've got, or if the state has uh, doing road construction or repair here in Middletown and doesn't want to go all the way to Portsmouth for whatever reason. I, um, 
the, yeah, I think the intention, uh, and a lot of this was kind of boilerplate language, um, but the intention was to open up that agreement in the event that we have um, other emergencies such as um, the bridges wash out, um, you know, all of a sudden the state police are now stranded or, um, you know, National Guard may need fuel in the event of an emergency. I, th I think that's why that's there. But um, like I said, primarily we're focused on DOT. Yeah, and I just think it's eliminating the, the words uh, of need and or you just so it would read in times of emergency period would would be how it was presented um, to us and would eliminate the um, the overlap. Um, so so that would be something to also talk about. And um, the last thing is, oh, and this is for Council Sean Brown, uh, you know, if we did find it wasn't working out, you know, there's a 10 day clause and to monitor it. I, I would request that we make sure that a DPW and financial report of this agreement at the end of each storm season is presented to the council. If the council thinks that's a good idea. Okay. Um, my feelings right now, and we can discuss this, is to uh, table this into a later meeting. Let Mr. Brown go back to um, DOT and the parties to be with uh, suggestions and recommendations that were made this evening by the counselors. But for us, we're not gonna settle this tonight. We're not going to, we're not going to sign a contract tonight, obviously. Okay, so I'm gonna make a motion that we uh, table this to a later meeting at which time Mr. Brown will bring this back to us um, and if there's any additional questions that any councils have in the interim, to please just send them off to Mr. Brown and he'll address them during his negotiations. Okay, so I have a motion. Second. Council of Toronto. Toronto. Present. Just while we have uh, a representative from the state, I have received a, a quick text from a couple of folks that were asking me in regards to the reasoning behind closing the current station and what is going to happen to that station. Um, it could be added or if he wants to address that at another time, that's fine. Or if he would like to address it tonight, if we have the time. Um, I, what I can speak to is as far as I understand, they're moving towards uh, filing a notice of closure um, for that depot. And the, and the point is to try and reduce you know, the footprint of, um, you know, state fleet operations and the number of depots that it manages. Um, but, but that's all I can give you at this point. I don't know what the intentions are with the land um, or the depots or, or fully the reasons, you know, uh, behind that particular station. But um, beside, you know, con you know, consumption was relatively low there. Um, but that's what I can give you at this point in time. Thank you, Richard. And okay. It, it just, you know, there, there is a wear and tear. There's something that maybe should be just a follow up, Mr. President. Also, I just want to stay the, on the docket item, okay? And the docket item is this agreement, okay? The reasons for their closure, um, they want to share that with us later, fine. Uh, Council Welch, you want okay, to- Okay, there's, there's obviously tanks and things there and clean up. So I guess we'll just save that for another time to better understand that. Yeah. But there is a lot of wear and tear that's going to be on our location things that we have to be prepared for. And so I'm hoping we're taking all these costs into consideration when we're negotiating this contract. And I would be interested in understanding what Portsmouth's contract looks like. Okay, uh, that's a fair. Um, and again, any councils with any additional questions that they have, they'd like to present to Mr. Brown while he's negotiating this, feel free to. And when Mr. Brown feels comfortable, we'll table it until uh, he sees fit to bring it back before the council. Okay, so the motion has been seconded by Council Santos. Any further conversation? Council Welch. Thank you, Mr. President. I understand what you're saying. I'll just throw this out there quickly. Uh, if we're negotiating, <clears throat> then we want, uh, what would, how about first right of refusal on that property? Good point. Oh. Okay. All right, so we have a motion and it's been second to table this to a later date at which time Mr. Brown will bring something back to us that he feels is in line with the conversation from the councils this evening. 
All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, we have one in opposition to that. Yeah. Councilor Toronto's in opposition to uh, continuing it. Oh, no, I'm for it. No, I'm sorry. I must have misread. I'm in favor of uh, postponing it and bringing it back. So you're in favor of tabling it until the town administrator brings it back to us at a later date. Okay. Great. Yes. All right. Item number 12. Memorandum of the town planner through the town administrator, RE 2020, Rhode Island DEM Trails Grant Application. Motion is received, said memorandum. Second. And motion is second to receive. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Item number 13. Conversation? In a minute. Oh, I'm sorry. Resolution. Okay. Item number 13. Resolution of the Council authorizing the planning department to prepare and submit the 2020 Rhode Island DEM Trails Grant application. Motion to pass said resolution. Second. And okay, we have a motion and a second. Conversation. Councilor Flynn. I was not sure I understood the matching and, and cost. And I'm not, if someone is around to explain the numbers, I'm not sure I was reading them where they belonged. Who would you like that to be? Somebody from Rhode Island? Is DEM? planning, is, uh, do we have planning here? Or Sean, I guess. Sean's on this Ron's memo. On. Ron's on. Ron's on. Mr. Olowski. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Ron. Good evening. Uh, Councillor Flynn, uh, I'll be happy to answer the question. I, I guess maybe just to jump in quickly, um, the total grant project is estimated to be just over $187,000. Uh, the maximum grant we can request is $100,000. The grant requires a 20% match minimum. However, since the project should it go forward as proposed is, is uh, $187,000, we would more than uh, meet that 20% um, match requirement. So I don't know if that gets to what your question was. Yeah, so my, I guess my only question is if there's any way to run the project so we can take advantage of the grant but only spend the 20%, the 20,000. If you w wish to reduce the scope of the project, certainly we could do that. It just seems that if we can get 100,000 for 20,000 versus 100,000 for 87,000, that would be preferable to me. But that that's, was that's my- fine, question. but again, it, it would just be reducing the scope of the project, the trails, the amount of trails that are proposed on the map that was provided for the docket, that would have to be reduced. And is that, po I guess, is that possible? Is there a, a plan to that could maybe do some or a good bulk of it now and some uh, uh, later with another grant round? Certainly, sure. Okay. Yeah, we would, we would work and, and I believe this was discussed in the memo uh, that we did, uh, planning staff did work with the tree commission and the open space and fields committee to lay out the proposed trail extension and then with the help of the town engineer came up with the cost estimate. So it would be a matter of just going back probably to those two committees and having them uh, help us and, and the town engineer look at revising that design. And you could do that by the January 28th due date? Perhaps not, but I think that we would submit the grant application and this would come back to you prior to accepting the grant should we get an award and then in the interim, we could work with DEM to revise the scope of the project. Um, I don't know that we would be, we would have time to actually revise um, what was put together in the map. And with, you know, with a revised cost estimate and whatnot. And, and to the uh, IDEM, I guess is where this would be being applied to. They would be okay if you were awarded the grant to a scaled down version? We would work with them as we were submitting the grant application to let them know that we were reconsidering the scope of the project. The, the amount of the grant request would not change because the maximum is $100,000. It would just be advising them that the town may not wish to proceed with the full scope um, using the amount of town money that we are considering at the moment. 
I, I think I'm more comfortable with that, but I'll, you know, listen to what everyone else has to say too. Okay, I have the vice president, then I have council of vice president. So um, part of the monies, Ron or Sean, there was in-kind services mentioned there. Is that part of the 20? That's not part of the 20% because we're required to match 20%, but the rest of that money, the, you know, whatever it is, 57,000 and change, that could be done in in-kind services and we could get the whole, the full, full trails done. Is that accurate? We, we can, yes, we can use in-kind services actually for at least part of the match. We could use in-kind services as well, even for part of that 20%. Um, we, we, you may recall DPW staff uh, did a lot of work in installing the trails on the northern section of the park. And so that would be another option to, to save some money. Um, well, it may not save a lot of money. It would, in terms of the uh, amount of uh, cash we'd have to lay out, that could be reduced if we were using town staff and equipment to construct portions of the trails. Okay. How's the look? Thank you, Mr. President. Um, so I'm kind of on the same vein as everybody else here. And I figured that timing would be an issue for the grant. And I know that given the uh, line items or the big, the big numbers that were put out to come up to the total cost, uh, you can't take any of those out of the project, obviously. But just ballpark looking at it, if you were to eliminate the southernmost loop, uh, the southernmost almost full loop, that is about at least a third of the trails. If you did the northern two thirds of it, to two thirds of the total cost, it'd bring you down to $125,000, which then um, we're not spending nearly the money. And I, and I, Ron, I'm sure that you need to better way to balance that. But if going through all those numbers, um, I bet it'd be pretty close. So timing wise, is it would it be possible to knock it down to two thirds and come back with it and still have it time to submit the grant? Well, I, I guess I would suggest that we could go ahead and as quickly as possible, have the town engineer look at what you've suggested and the others have suggested in terms of trying to reduce the total project down to something that's more in line with the $100,000 grant plus the 20%. And then uh, if, we, if we have time, prepare the grant application with, with that information, that revised information, if that's what the council wishes. Let me just, let me just interject something. Tonight's resolution is simply for the authorizing the planning department to prepare and submit the 2020 Rhode Island DEM trails grant application. We're not authorizing any expenditures of funding. So like Ron said, and Ron, correct me if I'm wrong, we've done enough of these. This is gonna come back to the council again with the resolution of a proposed plan by Ron and his people that'll say, Here's the plan. This is how much money we want you to authorize. Am I right, Ron? That, that's correct, yes. This, this would always come back to you before we accept any grant money and certainly the approval of- So it's right. gonna come back to us again. Mr. President. Mr. Brown. I, I guess my issue is if I, I'm not comfortable going with the unknown sort of project. Um, the upcoming budget is tight and we're moving dollars around for, for numerous different things, including whatever may come up in our discussion Thursday regarding the upcoming work plan for the next two years. So, and I can appreciate what Ron is saying as the planner, but from a holistic standpoint, if if the council isn't interested in doing the project with this scope, I would ask that we go back, sit with the engineer, redefine the scope and the cost before the council votes on it. Um, I'd simply ask that we take this off the agenda for tonight and we I'll have, submit it. We have a cutoff time, correct me if I'm wrong, January the 28th, correct? We do, but the alternative is you simply don't do the project this year and you wait for another year. Well, 
here's my thought process. We authorized to prepare it and submit it. And I, I, I don't, I understand some of your logic, but I don't really, I, I think there's other funding that we could maybe get a hold of, maybe like the, the, Quin, the Quinnick Land Trust might want to help us out with a project like this, which is uh, beneficial to everybody. And it goes in the theme with them uh, that may help us out, or we might get some funding from somebody else that may help us out. To put to kick this off for another year, I, I personally don't think it's the right thing to do. Then I would ask you to vote for the $187,000 project as proposed by the administration. Instead of trying to ham and egg this into something that's smaller, that's going to be in multiple phases, and trying to figure out how to squeeze this in to, to really a smaller budget. Um, a considerable amount of work went into this with the open space committee and the uh, tree commission and the planning department and the town engineer. And uh, it's just, again, I think we're trying to finish this last phase of the project to connect it to Adelaide, to connect it to the existing trail network. Right. We, we can work to bring the number down, but um you know, I, I think a lot of thought went into putting a project together and, and I appreciate, you know, yes, we, we can, we can scurry and try to put together a bunch of things together uh, with the upcoming budget. But I, I am very concerned that this is not going to be the only time you're going to ask me to put something together in the upcoming budget. And it's going to become more and more complex and we're going to be chasing around a deficit um, as we try to get it down and, and ultimately managing expectations and disappointment. So you, you factored this number into the upcoming budget, the, uh, the, let's say the $67,000. In my mind, it would come from the capital replenishment fund. It would come from the open space and recreation bond. There's, there's numerous sources to pay for the match. Um, it wouldn't necessarily come from the operating budget, but what's being discussed by the council night tonight is to force it down into the operating budget, which causes other issues within, you know, what we're looking at. Okay, Vice President, you had your hand up first. Council Flynn, I got you. Thank you. Um, I would just like to see what, what the number is from in-kind services and where it brings the, the total number down. I mean, that's, that's the un, one of the unknowns that we don't know. Um, and I, Bob, I do agree with you that I think, if, I don't think we should push this off, but I think we should have more facts around this before we make a decision, I guess. But uh, you know, I guess I guess kind of contradict myself a little bit, but I know we have a, another, couple, another meeting. Um, I just think that I'd like to know what, the, what some of the solid numbers are around it. Um, and where that funding would exactly come from. But I, I don't want to, I, I personally don't want to push this off. One of the things that we've done in Middletown is, as, as, as a community, is to continue to beautify and, and improve quality of life. Um, and that, that park is used tremendously. Um, and I, I just think it's a great addition. When I saw it, I got excited. Um, I think it's the right thing to do. It's just a matter of funding. And, and, I, and I think that uh, let's nail some numbers down with the in-kind services and um, let's do it. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna repeat what I said earlier. This is tonight is merely authorizing the planning department to prepare and submit this. Yes. We're not authorizing any expenditures. So if we, and I'm contrary to what Mr. Brown's thought process was, I think we should move with this tonight. Let it come back to us again later on when we're going to get the picture of exactly what's being done for X amount of money. Ron has a feel of it right now. Mr. Brown has a feel of it right now. Bring it back to us, which will give us adequate time to apply for, apply for this grant, which is here in front of us tonight, right now, and later on, we're gonna have time to decide on funding the grant or not. Tonight isn't, we're not accepting the grant tonight. And, and we're not proposing 
a resolution of monetary expenditure to it. All we're doing tonight is authorizing the preparing the grant and submitting the grant. So, if you, you know, and, and again, I, I don't understand. I understand all the logic. Let's cut it down. Let's do this. Let's save some money. We prepare the budget. I understand all that. But basically, tonight it has nothing to do with what we have in front of us tonight. It has to do with it at a later time. Council Flynn. Uh, and and I and I appreciate that focus, Mr. President. I I just wanted to point out to um, Councilor Rodericks. I think what Ron was saying with the in kind is that it still costs us money because you got to pay for those laborers for their time and their effort. I, and I understand. I understand all that, Terry. Okay. So, and, and, uh, and, you know, Mr. Brown, I'm not sure that I understand your all or nothing attitude. I think getting two thirds of it done with a small amount of taxpayer money is a win-win for everybody. I don't think I, I agree uh, tapping into a bond and, and going into debt for it um, should be a, a consideration uh, in the COVID environment that we're crawling out of. And we still have to replenish our, our rainy day funds. So I, I guess I would leave the conversation with, uh, you know, the path going forward, as Mr. President um, suggests, but with those, yeah, that understanding of um, how it can be a win-win for, for the citizens and for our pocket. Okay. And, and Council Welch. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, so I'm a little, I'm a little, I don't understand where uh, Mr. Brown's coming from because initially he said, just go for the 187,000. I'm sorry, he said that afterward, but before he was concerned about the budget going forward. So those two thoughts didn't make sense to me. So I, I don't know uh, which just you're to saying clarify, to go. There's, you have an operating budget that's using tax dollars. Mm -hmm. And then we have non-operating dollars, which would, in you know, come from either bond proceeds or some other capital reserve. And as I'm listening to the discussion, we're moving the project over to the operating budget. That's my concern. We're moving over to where we're making other decisions relating to how we operate the town. Um, again, when I originally looked at the project, when it was brought forward to me by the committees, by the planner, by the town engineer, it was a $185,000 project to provide the services that the community deserves, but it was doing it from that non-operating source instead of taking money from the operating budget. So I'm looking at the classification of funding that we're using to fund the program. I'm not trying to deny anyone, but I, I do wanna recognize that yes, we are in a pandemic we haven't started to recover from a pandemic. And, you know, there is a need to show some conservation in the way we spend money. Um, but my point being, I can see funding this from the non-operating dollars to a non-operating source, which we can fund, you know, again, from funds, not only, you know, that will be more readily available during a recovery or post pandemic uh, economy. Uh, that, that's what I'm considering. And I understand that and, and thank you, but I, where did we go from open space money to operating budget? Why couldn't we do the scaled down version and take our, our payment in kind from open space money? I think I'm looking at the magnitude of the dollars. I, I probably wouldn't spend the money to go borrow $20,000 from the bank, but as we get okay. to a, a greater number, um, it makes more sense to me. Okay, I, I didn't. I, that wasn't clear to me initially. And lastly, um, Ron, what are the odds? Like, like the president saying, "Let's just go ahead. We're not authorizing it to spend any money tonight. Just to tell you to go ahead and submit the proposal, which is I'm for." What are the odds that we can go in at 187 and say we get down to you know something less than that? Is that past practice? Is that a thing? Are you asking about getting less grant money than we're requesting? Is that no, 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 no. Still, still getting all the hundred from the state, but you know whether we spend eighty-seven or twenty-seven will obviously scale the scope of the project down. But no, we still want all the, the state money. It's just 
how big the project is. Does that affect their decision? Well, like I said earlier, I think we would have to make clear to them when we're submitting the grant that there's a potential that the town wouldn't put in as much funding as being proposed. We would certainly have to meet the minimum match requirement, Right. but we would, assuming that we're not gonna be submitting a, a, a request of uh, less than what we're talking about tonight, uh, we would make clear to them that there is an ongoing conversation that should the grant be awarded to the town as a possibility the scope might be reduced. Okay. And the, and the guaranteed grant match is 20,000, correct, Ron? Yep, 20% of the, well, and 20. Back again, tonight is just, let's put the paperwork in. Let's move this ahead. This is gonna come back to us again later on. Council Toronto. Thank you, Mr. President. So this proposal would have to be adjusted because we're, is this the paperwork that we were gonna be submitting in regards to the scope of the project along with the grant? This is, just, this is just a draft of the grant application that Rita put together. So this hasn't been finalized yet. So we might have to revise some of the discussion to, if we're gonna uh, make it clear to the state that there's uh, some wiggle room in the town's uh, funding potential, we would make that uh, clear in the grant that we submit. Because you do have total estimated costs. You've got timelines put together in here when, you know, spring 2021, you know, all the different steps to the project, the scope of work, the dollar amounts, and it shows that we're committing 87,000. So this would all have to be updated to reflect the 20. Yeah, and I would just reiterate what the president said that we're not committing anything by submitting this grant application. This is a, a proposal. If, and if we get awarded a grant, there would be not only the town council's next step, which would be to consider a, accepting the grant, there would also be a contract with the state that we would have to review and enter into that would lay out all of the things that are highlighted in this grant application uh, before the town actually signs the, the contract. So again, I, I would look at this grant proposal when you're looking at those types of details, uh, timelines and and those sorts of things as being preliminary at this point, and that will all be finalized before a grant um, contract is signed. Okay. Cut. Yeah. The motion to pass said resolution. And again, to reiterate it one more time, there's no monetary. Right. Expenditure no. attached to this. Okay. And it's been seconded. Council of Toronto. Bob, this is not going to come back when we get approval and say we've already approved it. No. Let's do it. No. We're not going to have that happen. If you read the docket item, it clearly says we're authorizing the planning department to prepare and submit a 2020 RIDEM trails grant application. We're not, we're not, they have to prepare it, come back to us. DEM has to get involved in it. This is not etching stone. There's no monetary authorization in this. Every time we issue any kind of monetary expenditure is done with a resolution. There's none attached to this. Zero. And I'm in agreement with it. And this is the first time we've seen it. And we this are going out. I've dealt with things like this. this I is know, but what I'm saying is, we have a tight budget this year, and this is outside our budget. Okay. But we don't even, we haven't even voted whether we want to cut it by that much money. Okay, so let's, let's just take care of this. Okay, unless there's any other questions in regards to this one motion. Okay, it's been, it's, the motion has been seconded. All in favor to pass said resolution tonight, signify by raising your hand. Aye. Opposed? Okay, thank you. I don't, item, number, item number 14, <clears throat> presentation of the town administrator, upcoming beach season. Uh, Mr. Brown, um, just, just be conscious of the time. Uh, we're not going to get through this docket tonight. Uh, we're creeping up on 10 o'clock right now. Okay, so uh, Mr. Brown, uh, do we, uh, Vice President, do we have a motion to begin said presentation? Second. We have a motion second to begin the presentation. All in favor? Aye. Aye. 
Mr. President? Yes. Could I just clarify with Mr. Brown that this is a, just a presentation and a question that I got. Um, will there be other public input to this presentation? Is this, you know, like a plan that still, uh, you know, would um, allow public input? And has the Beach Commission um, weighed in on this? Let me ask, let me just, from my perspective, this is still evolving, okay? And the Beach Commission has been made aware of this. Mr. Brown and I met with the Beach Commission, the, the chair and the vice chair, and they're aware of this. Okay. okay. So I'm sure Mr. Brown will touch on that with you, but we did meet with them and we, we um, let them know this plan. And um, they were very receptive, in fact, by the way. But Mr. Brown, you've got um, a half an hour, Mr. Brown. Short of time, I hope. <coughs> Thank you, Mrs. Santos. Um, You'll do it. You'll do it. I, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go quick. So uh, at the last council meeting, uh, Councilor Rodericks had put together uh, a list of um, suggestions or recommendations for the upcoming beach season. And I believe the council president asked me to put together a document that summarizes, and I'll call it the working operating plan. Um, when we get to the last page of this, this is a document that next goes to the Beach Commission. Um, it also needs to go to the departments um, as they start working through the details and uh, start working on the operating budget and capital plan. Um, so there is a lot of work associated with this, but it provides a framework for the direction that we're headed. So if we can go to the next slide. Uh, again, there's some other issues that we need to face besides uh, changes. Uh, COVID-2, uh, COVID itself is still an issue. Uh, God willing, we will be more open than we were last year when it comes to the summertime. Uh, but guidance from the state as well as the CDC are going to govern exactly how we open the beach. Go to the next slide. Operating goals. Uh, these are some of the issues that um, Paul Rodericks brought up on his slide last, last meeting. Prioritize resident access. Uh, we were very successful with that. Uh, we want to operate safely. We want to operate efficiently and in a cost-effective manner. Uh, one of the things that we've spent a lot of time on is looking at uh, profit margin as we operate the beach and making sure we maintain that. Uh, we want to be good stewards of the natural environment. And lastly, we want to create a positive experience for the beach patrons. Uh, one of the areas I want to cover first uh, with the hiring of Matt Shealy and, and focusing on communications, uh, we want to promote the, the, the beach as a family friendly destination. And I think that's really a critical point um, in trying to curb some of the bad behavior that we've been experiencing. So uh, working with Matt, that is going to be a theme that we really push over the next six months that uh, Middletown beaches are for families. Um, also, we plan on launching the new website in March and part of the focus will be on having uh, a focus on the beach, uh, a single area where people can go to get beach information. Uh, lastly, one of the areas that we were successful with is providing notifications through social media um, and we'll continue to do that in the upcoming beach season. Uh, beach operations, uh, we're looking at basically extending hours. This is one of the areas that we did last year and it was successful. It was very successful from the standpoint that once the, what we, what we have found in the past is that when the staff disappears, uh, basically people take advantage and, and they, they, they litter the beach, they leave things behind. Uh, they don't, they're, they're not good stewards of the beach without some management, some uh, crew uh, happening. Uh, the other issue that we've run into is that the parking lots become overrun. Uh, so we are looking that between Memorial Day and June 30th, operating the parking lots from eight o'clock to four o'clock. Uh, we need to make an adjustment here where the lifeguards need hours need to match the parking lot operations. And then getting through July through Labor Day is operating on a longer basis from eight in the morning till 6 p.m. Uh, parking and lifeguards and uh, giving the lifeguard, uh, the beach manager, uh, the opportunity to adjust those hours depending on what's actually happening at the beach. 
Uh, similar to last year, locking the lots at nine o'clock at night, except for with the exceptions of Surfer's End and the boat ramp lots, which would remain open uh, overnight. Uh, just going through the parking lot operations, uh, the boat ramp and I guess third beach overall, we're looking at that being a resident beach, continuing what we did last year. So essentially you would need a resident season permit to access that um, parking facility. Uh, we would need to have some access for people that are towing boats that are non-residents and accessing the moorings. And that's similar to what we did last year. Uh, the main lot, we would look to operate that for resident season permit holders, non-resident season permit holders and daily permit holders. Daily permit holders being people who purchase a, a daily pass. So um, pending you know, how we're doing with COVID, we would, we would start that program back up. Uh, one of the areas that we continue is that 50% of the parking spaces at the main lot would be reserved for Middletown residents. And the beach manager would have the discretion to manage that reservation. So um, at some point, uh, if the lot is not filling with, with residents, he would be able to fill it with non-resident or daily parkers. Uh, hopefully with more people being allowed in the lot, that would be an easier um, thing to manage in the upcoming season. Um, whereas last year we had a, a very small number of spots. So uh, it was left less left to the discretion of the beach manager. Uh, and similar, we would control access to the beach through lanes at the main gate, uh, one lane for residents and then a second lane for all other transactions. Uh, so really the, the main lot would operate very similar to last year with the exception of the daily parking permits being sold. And um, hopefully with the restriction in COVID, uh, uh, restrictions, we'd be able to have more people uh, in the lot itself. If you can go back for a second to the slide before, sorry. Uh, the town beach lot, um, that would be season permit old only. That's the, uh, and that would be similar to what's historically been allowed in that lot. Go to the next slide. Uh, surfers lot, uh, similar to last year, we would reserve that to season resident parkers uh, permit holders only for the season. And uh, Triangle A across the street would be restricted to resident season permit holders and non-resident season permit holders. Uh, right now, the plan is not to open the St. George's lot for the season. And Triangle B would also not be available to parking, but we would use that lot to sell seasonal parking passes. Uh, as of now, uh, we don't anticipate changing the fee structure. Um, at the beaches. So it would be the same fee structure that's subject to change as we put the, uh, the budget together. Uh, some of the other changes, we're looking at selling the seasonal passes online via ViewGov licensing. Um, we have offered the passes online prior, um, although we, we haven't been as successful with it as we'd like. So. Uh, the goal would be to go full-blown online sales in the upcoming season. Uh, we would also sell seasonal passes at the gazebo located at Triangle B. On daily passes, we would restrict the daily passes being sold only at the main lot. And uh, right now, again, with COVID, we're looking at a focus of only accepting credit and debit cards. Uh, last season, we looked at using a mobile parking application from LIZ Parking who actually provides the parking uh, software and application to the state beaches. Uh, we would look to work with them, uh, pick up where we left off the conversation last year and, and try to implement that for the upcoming season. Uh, a lot of changes, not a lot of changes, but a, a numerous changes when it comes to the concessions. Uh, the surf concession at Second Beach will operate as it did uh, in prior years. It's in the fifth year of its contract. Uh, I plan to talk to the Beach Commission about looking at a equipment rental concession at Second Beach. That's something that's been entertained in the past, uh, but it is something that um, in order to replace some of the lost revenue, we would um, talk about implementing in the upcoming year. Uh, we have a equipment rental operating already at Third Beach. 
Uh, it's in the fifth year of the contract. Uh, the one thing I need to do is talk to the operator about how we would allow non-residents to access the concession. So that's something we would need to work out. Uh, fitness concessions. Uh, there's been a lot of talk. I get a lot of complaints from residents about the fitness concession. Uh, the special use permits that are issued for uh, people that operate fitness operations. Uh, the discussion I'm going to have with the Beach Commission is actually bidding out a concession uh, for people to operate the, the conce uh, a concession at the beach, partly to increase the revenue that we receive and also to enter into a more formal agreement restricting what they can and can't do. Um, but a big part of that not only is, is revenue generation, but as I said, uh, local residents routinely complain about the fact that their passive recreational opportunities are being upset uh, by the uh, early morning activities. The food concession at the main pavilion, uh, we actually uh, ended our agreement with the current vendor and uh, the goal in the upcoming year is to suspend um, operation of the food concession at the main pavilion. And I think it's on the next slide is basically to go out to bid and work out a model where we have multiple mobile concessions selling food on the property. Um, and then we have the mobile food concession at Surfer's End, which is operated by Dell's Lemonade with a subcontract to Flat Waves. Uh, we have a mobile food concession at the boat ramp, which is operated by Dell's Lemonade. It's in the last year of its contract. And what I was just talking about is that switch between the food pavilion uh, being sold at the main lot is uh, replacing that with a uh, mobile food concessions. And that's actually a recommendation that came forward from the council subcommittee in 2008. Um, essentially, we would be implementing this a year sooner, uh, not waiting for the contract with the prior vendor to end. Uh, so that's, that's something else that we'll be contemplating. Uh, the campground, uh, right now we have it identified to op open on May 22nd and close on September 26th. Uh, we're looking at doing seasonal reservations only. Uh, the fee for the upcoming year is increasing to $8,800. Prior year it was $7,800. And one thing that we need to do is replace the two storage containers at the campground. Um, that Those are used by the campers uh, when they leave things on the property from season to season. Uh, for moorings, uh, we're looking at switching from our current online system over to Dockwell Marina Management's application to do online reservations. Uh, we'll be able to use that system for the moorings and we'll be able to use that system for the dinghy and kayak reservations. Um, we would also use that system to take reservations on the transient moorings, which would um, allow us to decrease our reliance on the Harbor Master to collect those fees and enhance our internal controls. Um, and lastly, I think to make the transient moorings more appealing to people that are uh, coming through the area. Um, we do have a pending uh, initiative from the council to uh, submit a, an application to the state to uh, increase the number of moorings in the Harbor, um, increasing the existing number by 20. Uh, so that is one of the things that we'll look at submitting in the upcoming year. On the dinghy kayak rack, since Third Beach would become a resident beach, uh, we would be looking to convert that, that program basically over to all residents and um, not renting out spaces to non-residents with the exception of someone who may have a mooring uh, and, and, and with a need to store a, a dinghy on, on the uh, on the racks. Uh, we are looking at restoring the family nights. Uh, the family nights would have to, um, regardless of what happens, we're gonna have to manage the capacity. We know that for the upcoming season. Uh, the discussion that we've had internally is to look at whether or not we have the ability to organize revenue generating events, not just the free community events, uh, we've also discussed whether or not there are events that we can organize on weekdays uh, during non-peak times to increase the number of people that are, that are utilizing the parking lot. So we're looking at that as a, a revenue generating opportunity. 
and also including in the budget, the end of season firework display next year. So special events, um, and this is something I think I'll have to work with the solicitor um, looking at the special event permit ordinance, but um, they are and have proven to be uh, problematic at the beach. Uh, they do interfere with residents' passive activities on the beach property itself. Um, they have spawned many complaints. So one of the things that I would like to do is have a conversation with the council on whether or not um, there is an interest in trying to uh, reduce the number of these events um, or, or put some sort of further restrictions on them so that, that they don't interfere with uh, beach activity itself. And this is, this is uh, consistent with really a lot of discussions that have happened over the years with the Beach Commission. We are trying to put so many different events on the beach. Um, it's somewhat of a challenge to find the balance so that uh, each activity can happen um, without conflicting with the other. And I think there's um, some opportunity to put some further restrictions on the special events so that we can establish some of the equilibrium that residents uh, feel has been lost on the property. Um, and I think our focus will mostly be looking at trying to rein in the commercial activities that are happening on the property. Uh, public safety, there was a lot of discussion last year and in prior years about enforcing ordinances and codes on the beach. One of the proposals from the police chief in the upcoming budget is they're gonna be the use of community service interns, basically a summer uh, auxiliary police force uh, during the summer months to enforce certain uh, codes that exist on the town's books. Uh, so we are looking at utilizing the, those interns as a way of augmenting our public safety efforts on the beach. Uh, we did assign an EMS detail to the beach on days when the beach was at, at operating at a high capacity. Uh, that was a program that was well received, not only by beach patrons, but by the staff. Um, it was a, a, a real increase in uh, comfort in operating the beach. So we'll look to expand that programming in the upcoming year. And then I will work with the police chief regarding the need for additional security cameras uh, down to monitor beach operations. And again, that's a, a recommendation that came from the committee in 2018. Uh, we do need to rework the org chart. There were recommendations that came forward in last year's beach reports uh, regarding where there were, was excess capacity uh, there's been request for additional work in other areas. So that's something that needs to be worked on uh, by the staff in the upcoming weeks. Uh, one thing that we do need is we do need an actual adult to manage the maintenance operations or the crew. Um, it's just a, an essential position where, where we do need someone with some maturity oper uh, overseeing that, that part of the beach operation. Uh, we will need to recruit a new harbor master and assistant harbor master in the upcoming year. Uh, we don't have people returning into those positions. And uh, one thing I do want to do in the upcoming weeks is get the job descriptions and job book updated for each position so that we're, we're better ready to open up in the May timeframe. Uh, lifeguards, uh, for the past two summers, the Rhode Island Interlocal Trust has hired the American Red Cross to do random inspections of our lifeguard operations. They actually uh, go in, they, they meet with our lifeguards, they check to make sure they're properly equipped, properly trained. Uh, they inspect our training records to make sure that we're drilling properly. And, and from those two reports, and, and we just recently got the the feedback from the American Red Cross. We do have some improvements that need to be made in the upcoming season. They're well documented and the staff um, should be able to address those at the very beginning of the season. Um, I think what we'll see is we'll bring the lifeguards in a little bit early, uh, go through the required training, make sure it's documented and make sure that they have all the equipment that's required of them uh, while they're guarding the bathers and the, uh, the shoreline. Uh, but that is an area of focus in the upcoming year. Uh, water quality testing. We were actually talking about this early in the beach. Uh, we do need to formalize the water quality testing program for second and third beaches, uh, third beach harbor and the beach. 
uh, areas that we need to prioritize. Uh, there is a creek that empties on the north side of Third Beach. Uh, when we tested that beach over the last year, uh, we did in the testing identify uh, human proteins um, in the, the creek water. So we need to chase that uh, up the watershed to see where the, the contaminant or the bacteria is coming from. Uh, so that is a project that needs to happen with the uh, warmer weather um, in the upcoming year. Uh, we do do a water quality testing in Third Beach Harbor. And that's because we have a, what they call a conditional water quality certification of the Harbor. Uh, so we need to continue testing uh, the water itself. And lastly, over the last uh, year, uh, and a little bit of two years ago, we have had some closures of Surfers End at Second Beach. Uh, so we do need to spend some time testing the water out, out there and do a little bit of investigation along the uh, shoreline, uh, the rocky shoreline going out towards the, uh, the Esplanade. There are a number of capital projects that we're looking at right now. Uh, the first is DEM is requiring us to have a pump out boat that meets uh, the Department of Health Standards for Capacity. Uh, that is a purchase that's eligible for grant funding, but looking at the fact that we have uh, water quality issues at Third Beach, we operate not only the beach, but the, uh, uh, the boring field, which we are looking to expand. There's discussion about a floating pier. Uh, the Department of Health and RIDEM is looking at the fact that we need to upgrade our ability to pump uh, wastewater from boats. Uh, so that's an item that will be discussed. The uh, purchase and installation of the floating pier at the boat ramp is still an item that's outstanding from the 2018 recommendations. Uh, we need to purchase a new vehicle to tow the harbor master or, or identify a, a vehicle to har uh, tow the harbor master boat as well as a pump out boat. Uh, we need to improve our crosswalks on second on Satuous Beach Road. Uh, one of the things that we've identified with ride sharing is that we do need to identify and formalize a drop off location for beach patrons. And then lastly, we have a number of improvements that we need to contemplate in the main parking lot, um, extending entrance lanes, um, trying to uh, clean up the sandy area around the main concession stand, patching asphalt, looking at reconditioning the surface of the lot. Um, the guide rails at the northwest side of the lot are, are really in bad shape. And then we have fencing that we need to be, uh, begin to address along the south side of the lot. Uh, other projects which are more of an operating nature down at the beach, uh, signage, enhancing and updating signage, fewer signs with better messaging, also messaging related to dogs, which is an ongoing issue at the beach. Uh, we have some further improvements that need to be made to the Town Beach parking lot. We need to add some additional material and we need to identify or add some additional curb stops to delineate parking. Uh, we are installing anchored swim markers at second and third beaches. That's actually underway right now um, instead of the uh, cinder block system that we've been using and requires a tremendous amount of maintenance. Uh, upgrading the announcements that we put in the loudspeakers, uh, having professional announcements, uh, finding someone like the solicitor with a loud bellowing voice to uh, make those announcements for us, but we need to clean those up. Uh, shade structures require replacement and maintenance. Uh, they're in, in tough shape right now. Uh, continue to plant dune grass. Uh, we do need to review and implement some of the traffic calming practices um, that were recommended at the intersection of Paradise, Purgatory, and Satuous Point Roads. Those are not structural uh, changes, but more uh, operational changes that the police department need to implement uh, during the busy weekends. And then lastly, um, we need to work with DEM to improve the maintenance and regulation of the Purgatory Chasm parking lot. Um, that became a huge issue this past year, um, but even not last year when it was, was, a, was a, an issue because of limitation of parking. It's, it's been an ongoing issue and sort of an orphan uh, responsibility of DEM, um, which unfortunately has a negative impact on residents in that area of town. Uh, policy proposals. Uh, we are looking to continue the carry in, carry out trash program. 
uh, that became more effective when we expended operating hours. Uh, so we, we're looking to build upon the progress that we made last year. Uh, there was a recommendation from 2018 regarding Town Ordinance 93.11. Um, it has to do with the assignment of moorings. The current ordinance has them being reassigned if they're unused for two years. Uh, the committee recommended that we reassign them if they've been unused for one year. And uh, that's just uh, an administrative item that we need to take care of. And uh, lastly, we have the enhanced parking fine program, uh, which needs to be implemented. Uh, that's an item that you have received. It's been referred to the solicitor and uh, we'll get that uh, implemented for the upcoming beach season. Uh, planning, uh, we have been working to update and adopt the town harbor, town's harbor management plan. Um, this has actually been going on as long as I've been with the town, uh, but I would like to finally get that updated in the upcoming year. Uh, so that's, that's a, a project that's, that's long overdue. Uh, probably the, the last thing here, which is I think really critical is developing and adopting a master facilities plan for second and third beaches. Um, since I've been with the town, we've gone around in circles on, on how we want to address buildings and facilities and, and boat ramps and piers. And um, it really makes a lot of sense to me for us to work with the Beach Commission to adopt the master facilities plan uh, so that these projects can be considered and adopted in a, in a more measured way. Uh, because we, we seem to know that we have these needs, but we never follow through uh, with them. And, and while we do that, we, we expend a, a considerable amount of resources, um, which not only has a fiscal impact, but also I think a, a mentally exhausting impact on not only the residents who are for or against a project, but also for the staff. So um, I think actually taking a step back and developing a, a master facilities plan is long overdue. Uh, as the council president mentioned, um, we did have the opportunity to talk with the chair and vice chair of the beach commission. Uh, right now, the plan is to meet with them at their January meeting. Uh, the staff is in the process of beginning to develop the operating budget, uh, the capital budget, and uh, the staff are working through steps to begin implementation of the uh, things that are necessary for the upcoming beach season. Uh, into Councillor Friend's point. This is a, uh, an ongoing discussion. I think similar to last year, uh, we, I did put a little bit of effort in putting this presentation together so that we can work through it and update it um, as we get closer to Memorial Day. Uh, but it is a, an ongoing effort to open the beach. And again, going back to some of those original priorities, making the, the beach a priority for, for residents, making it safe, making it family friendly. Um, you know, we wanna keep track of the progress and decision-making that we're, you know, uh, that we're addressing so that we actually uh, achieve each one of those. So um, my goal would be similar to last year is to use this as a, a baseline document and make the changes as the discussion continues towards Memorial Day. And I think that's 30 minutes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Um, fellow counselors, we're not going to get through this tonight. This is an important, important docket item. Um, however, I am going to um, allow uh, two people that requested to speak tonight, that called in to speak on this tonight before we adjourn for the evening. But we'll come back at our next meeting. We'll start from here, right where we are right now. We'll move forward with the rest of the docket. Uh, Mr. Frank, are you there, Mr. Frank? Madam Clerk, we had Mr. Frank. There he is. He's on mute. Okay, Mr. Frank. Yes. Okay, you have three minutes, Mr. Frank. Go right ahead. Thank you. In 2017, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the FDIC published a national survey of unbanked and underbanked households. Underbanked means that no one in the household had a check or savings account. In 2017, there were 8 million unbanked households representing over 20 million people. 
underbanked means that the household had an account at an insured institution, but also obtained products or services outside the banking system. These outside services include money orders, check cashing, payday loans, rent to own services, and pawn shop loans. In 2017, there were 24 million underbanked households representing over 64 million people. Taken together, the unbanked and the underbanked add up to more than 84 million people, 25% of the US population. The FDIC study included, concluded that unbanked and underbanked rates were higher among lower income households, black and Hispanic households, and households with, with volatile incomes. Families and individuals who are unbanked and lack credit use cash for their finances, paying bills with money orders, paying cash when they shop, buy gas, gas and eat out. A new trend of retail businesses around the country is to run cashless businesses. They do not accept cash, only credit and debit cards and direct withdrawals. Customers have been turned away when they offer paper money for their purchases. To give you an idea of the mentality of these businesses, Tony Zarzula, the owner of a now closed commerce restaurant in New York stated, if you don't have a credit card, you can use your debit card. If you don't have a debit card, you probably don't have a checking account. And if you don't have a checking account, you probably should not be eating here. Refusing to take cash is discriminatory by design and racist in practice. Refusing to take cash is illegal in Massachusetts. The 1978 law states that no retailer shall discriminate against a cash buyer by requiring the use of credit. Mm -hmm. Recent legislation preventing businesses from refusing cash has been introduced in New York and New Jersey. Number 14 on the January 4th, 2021 Middletown Council docket is, is a presentation called the upcoming beach, upcoming beach season. Page nine of the presentation includes the following. Daily passes will be sold only at the main lot. Only credit and debit cards will receive by LAZ parking mobile parking application. According to Housing Works Rhode Island, 39% of the households in Middletown are cost burden. A household is considered cost burden if it spends more than 30% of its income on housing. Families are paying so much rent that they often have to choose what to do without adequate nutrition, health care, among others. Many are two owner families working multiple jobs just to afford a place to live. It is more than likely that many of these households are unbanked or underbanked, do not have credit or debit cards, and use cash for their purchases. There's been a lot of talk about the preserving of quality of life in Middletown. Robert Sylvia has been most vocal about this. Yet the council has been presented with a proposal that would deny more than one third of its citizens the ability to visit the beach this summer. This promotion of economic stratification is unacceptable. It is part of a long-term trend by past councils to serve special vested interests at the expense of those least able to challenge the council's policies. Will the town ac accept cash as payment for access to Middletown beaches this summer? Thank you, Mr. Frank. Okay, Charlene. Charlene there, Charlene. I'm right here, hi. Okay, go ahead, Charlene. I can give you about three minutes. No problem. I just um, wanna say, um, are we gonna be back on again on Thursday? Is that what's- On Thursday, on the 19th. Okay, those... just so we know, because I gotta get that agenda out on Thursday, and this is on the docket. Okay. Tuesday. So thanks, Administrator Sean. Thank you, everybody. Happy New Year. Thank you, Charlene. Okay, um, again, um, it's that time. So we're going to uh, wrap it up for tonight and we'll um, postpone the remainder of this docket item conversation until our next meeting, at which time we'll finish the rest of the docket. Uh, Mr. Vice President, you're muted, Mr. Vice President. You're muted. We're going we're gonna to adjourn now. Is that what you want to do? Yes, we are. 10 okay. Okay. I just thought we could get through this other things pretty quick. We're motion to adjourn. Second. Okay, a motion second to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. See you on the seventh.